thank you Mo. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, although we are uh, not as near as we used to be, um, I used to be at the uh, Faculty of Engineering, uh, University of Malaya, and my room is actually at the tower. Uh, but now I'm in a supposed to be sunny Pantai Timur, but um, since last two weeks, we are having this continuous rain and I suppose the monsoon is still with us. Uh, so I hope you have a great and sunny day uh, and uh, we are supposed to have uh, roughly registered participants around 70 plus. Yes, Umu? Uh, yes, correct. Yes. Uh, we so, have half of them here. Right. So I suppose uh, people will be coming in um, from time to time. Mm -hmm. And perhaps some of you do have some uh, other commitment at the beginning. And maybe some of you will have to leave early. Whatever it is, uh, I do hope that, that we will have a fruitful and also um, blessed uh, session today. Um, and... Um, I would like to uh, welcome everybody to this uh, workshop. Um, this is not a webinar, this is a workshop. So I do hope that we work together. And what I mean by working together is that I would, I would prefer you to uh, basically uh, stop me at any time and ask me questions. And I do hope that EDEC will allow you to perhaps share your screen if you need to. Uh, but if you don't, you can uh, directly uh, unmute and also ask me uh, questions because um, I've discussed with um, ADAC team, uh, I do not actually create uh, uh, activities for you, uh, much activities for you. Um, and I think uh, we are all aware when it comes to curriculum design, um, I think that actually the topic is a little bit um, um, what I said a little bit uh, big uh, so we, we do hope that we will be able to cover as much as possible because from the participants list uh, I've seen there are quite a number of you who are in charge of um, either being a quality manager at your faculty or whether you are in charge of curriculum at your faculty and also developing others in developing curriculum. So I do hope that I can address spectrum of participants that we are having today. Um, although majority of you uh, said that you would, you would like to learn something new today, which I, I really love when you actually wrote that. Um, I think what I love about University of Malaya is that um, the lecturers at University of Malaya are full of uh, people uh, who are learned society, uh, apart from them being so excellent in their research work. So congratulations to University of Malaya. So without further ado, I would like to share my slide. Um, and uh, let's, have a, let's have a go. All right, I do create a gem board there, um, but before that, let me um, let me put up my slide and let me know whether you can see them well. Um, because when I am actually uh, putting up my slide, uh, I do not uh, see uh, the chat box uh, next to me. Uh, so from time to time, I do hope uh, Umu will be able to help me and. Uh, or any or anybody uh, help me to to stop me at any point and um, let's address uh, whatever that we have in the chat box yeah all right so, sure thank you thank you Mo. so basically um, the topic given to me originally was outcome based uh, education and I think we are all aware that uh, we have to uh, practice outcome based education in Malaysia um, and to be honest, outcome-based education is now being practicing almost uh, all over the world. Um, and there are reasons for why we have moved away from the content-based to outcome-based. And I do hope that um, if, if you'd like me to talk a little bit more about what's the difference between content-based and outcome-based, we can revisit uh, that particular part. But for the time being, 
uh, let's stick to uh, what I plan uh, for you. But uh, as I mentioned, whatever that I plan for you may not be something that you would like to go through. So as I mentioned, please stop me and uh, just just uh, take me to whatever direction that you would like uh, this session uh, to be discussing because at the end of the day, it's, it's the, the four hours is yours. So I will just follow the flow. Right, so I think it is fair to have a little bit of um, um, you know, uh, building up rapport here. Uh, I would like to find out uh, why is it that some of you are here? Anybody like to unmute and just very quickly uh, tell me um, why do you choose to come to this workshop? Uh, would you like to type in the chat, maybe? Because quite a lot of people prefer to type in the chat rather than to unmute. Yeah, maybe uh, I prefer. Yeah, sure. We uh, we want to learn and get any new ideas how to create a uh, effective curriculum and how to apply in our teaching sessions. Right, so would you like to, um, when you talk about, about your teaching session, uh, would you like me to zoom in into um, what you do at the course level? Because when we talk about curriculum, there are two different, two different levels. Uh, we are looking at the curriculum at the program level and also at the subject level. Right? Uh, uh, maybe more to program level? Uh, right, more to program level. Yeah, because I think uh, quite a lot of people are very familiar with the processes that you need to uh, go through at the subject level. Maybe you have not got uh, much better insight uh, what's happening at the program level. So that is exactly what we're going to do in the first half of uh, our workshop today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Um, Prof, can you hear me? Yes. So my name is Renuka. Oh, and, really? uh, Thank I, you. I am uh, just this. I'm coming up to my first year as a lecturer. I used to be a practitioner, um, and uh, I was hired uh, to bring industry experience into mm -hmm. uh, my teaching. Yep. So I'm interested in this course because, um, you know, when you said outcomes focused, I, uh, yeah, I'm very very interested in, in bringing uh, real world experience to the students. So sometimes it's more, uh, I find that as I teach, it's more about teaching them how to do something rather than what to do. Mm -hmm. And the how to do stuff is not um, in a lot of the content. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, some of the, the how to do stuff is not even in, in a lot of uh, research material. So mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I need to learn how to develop curriculum that uh, show students how to do stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know whether that is program level or subject level. So some, some insights on that might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Renika. It is interesting that you highlighted that it is important for us when we develop and also design our curriculum uh, to, to actually bring in the industry perspective. And although some of us are not considering to have an industry-driven curriculum, um, we still need to consider uh, input from industry because they are one of our stakeholders. Some of you may would may like to consider how to design a curriculum that is highly industry driven, like using to you to I, uh, which I'm going to touch a little bit on to you to I. How what is the structure? How are you going to design it? Uh, and what are the rules and regulation uh, uh, related to how you design a curriculum? when you bring in industry into your curriculum. And I also love your point when you mentioned about um, should we uh, teach or should we practice uh, uh, delivering our curriculum by focusing on the content or whether we need to give students something to do. Uh, recently, 
Um, I'm, I'm taking in some of the uh, recent input from the international webinar. We have been advised actually, a very wise advice uh, to bring in what they call early career struggle. Um, I'm sure many of us, when we teach in our classroom, we are very concerned about delivering content. Uh, however, we also need to be aware ourselves uh, before we need to impart our awareness to our students or, or develop their, their so-called graduate attribute. I think what we need to do is we also need to recognize early career struggle because at the end of the day, after we produce uh, our graduate, they will have to face what they call early career struggle. And it is normally the first two years uh, or the first three years that they had a lot of problem where they have to adjust uh, where they need to really uh, try and uh, make use of whatever the subject content that they have learned at university to the real uh, world scenario. Um, I, I, I really agree with you, Renuka, and that's a good point to, to start with. Um, is there any more people like to... Share why you are here because majority of you said that you would like to learn something. Some of you are really on the quality assurance um, group. Um, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Asia. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, I'm, I, I'm Nasia from mm -hmm. physics department. All right. So actually, uh, one saw the, uh, what this, uh, what we call, uh, this course. Uh, so, because uh, in future I plan to create the short courses for uh, in my area for general or for specific target group. So I'm not I'm not sure how to design to create uh, the short courses for them. Uh, in fact, I also involved in uh, I have been asked to create a MOOC uh, MOC uh, of of uh, what uh, of my subject, but then. Uh, it's quite struggling for me to create how to, I mean, to make the course become interactive or interesting for for people. Because in my area, uh, when we Google, there's a lot of emission. So that is one of the uh, challenge for me uh, because there's a lot of information, right? So for me to design or to create such a short course that can attract uh, public or uh, our targeted group so that's what that's uh, my aim for this course actually okay that's thank you thank you thank you, you Nas um, this is very interesting I also love uh, your input um, and thank you for bringing this up um, I think I think uh, we are all aware uh, there's a, there has been quite a lot of transformation in curriculum, um, which, I'm, which we're going to discuss this uh, in a bit. Um, we were at the state where we teach our students um, using the blackboard and then using the PowerPoint. And then suddenly we have been put um, on a situation where we have to teach remotely uh, in an online uh, uh, environment. And also uh, at the moment, I think U University of Malaya, um, through your vice chancellor, uh, um, what we call taklimat, eh, briefing and all that, um, I think you're all aware that you are, you have been encouraged to come up with MOOCs and also micro-credential or, or, or an online short courses. Um, all I'm saying is that um, whatever the transition uh, that we are in uh, at the moment, uh, be it uh, we are teaching face-to-face uh, -face in person or online remote condition or uh, we are already uh, um, in the development stage of our micro-credential and MOOC, uh, the fundamental that underpins all these are uh, curriculum design and development. Um, if we do not have a strong fundamental on curriculum design and development, I think it, it's, it is easy for us to come up with something that is quite 
try and uh, we will see the reason later on why is it that it is important for us to do a proper planning and proper development uh, because at the end of the day uh, all the hard work that you're going to put into development of your MOOC and also your micro credential especially uh, will be um, uh, will not give you a return of investment or will be at waste um, because you won't be able to actually perhaps uh, get people to buy into your course or, or perhaps it will not sustain. And similarly, with any programs or any subject, at the end of the day, it's all about making sure that our subject, our program, they are relevant, they are sustainable. And at the end of the day, it's not about ensuring they are relevant and sustainable. But at the end of the day, it's all about making sure that we are um, developing the right graduates, the right talent for our country or for uh, the uh, society at large out there. So I do hope that we can uh, stop here. Why am I here um, now? If we can uh, now gently start the session uh, by looking at uh, the session objectives. Uh, basically, these are the three session objectives that I propose to ADEC. Uh, I mentioned that uh, at the end of these four hours, I do hope that we have enough time. We will be able to discuss the process of effective curriculum design and also development. And we hope to be able to see how we can use one of the tools um, that we can uh, use during the planning stage to make sure that uh, we really need to offer the program or whether we really need to teach that particular subject or whether we really need to, to offer a particular MOOC or a particular micro-credential or even a content in our subject. So basically, state analysis is actually uh, what we call uh, a tool, uh, one of the tools that you can use to uh, identify the need of uh, the curriculum that you are going to develop, right? And also, I do hope that uh, within this, uh, in this four-hour session, we will be able to uh, go through um, what we call an industry landscape. Uh, this is also something um, that I would like to introduce to you because a majority of us, when we develop our programs or when we develop our subject or micro-credential or MOOC, we sometimes um, forgotten the bigger picture. Who are we trying to produce? So industry landscape will allow us to uh, be very certain to, to clearly see who am I going to produce. Therefore, I can actually um, uh, develop uh, my subject content or my program to uh, uh, produce the, 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 the kind of talent that I'm supposed to produce. We will discuss this in a minute. And I do hope that at the end of the day, we, we, we will be able to also uh, look at how we can apply the outcome-based education concept in curriculum development. Right. This is also something that you are very familiar with. And um, I think your ASCP and also um, QMAC is highly responsible in making sure that you are applying the outcome-based education in your curriculum design and development correctly. Um, as far as how you should develop your program and, and how you should develop your subject according to the outcome-based education. Um, there's a lot of reference that you can go for. Uh, and in fact, uh, in University of Malaya, because UM is fully ISO university, meaning that all processes have gone through the uh, quality assurance system. Uh, therefore, the processes has been well taken care of and you have uh, the so-called QMAC uh, MQF uh, forms. I'm sure you must have filled in the UMPT01, BR003, S01, something like that, right? Which I'm going to show you your documents uh, later on. 
Okay, uh, those are to make sure that you are actually applying outcome-based education in your practice. So you have been well taken care of uh, on that. But I'm, what I'm going to show you today is something that uh, not covered by um, the uh, UM official uh, quality assurance form, neither is being covered in the COPA2 or MQF. Um, for example, like steep analysis and industry landscape, these are the two tools that I've learned from Singapore. Um, and in Singapore, if you submit um, your um, proposed program that you'd like to offer in any university or polytechnics, uh, it is a must for you to actually submit your steep analysis. So that is the first uh, hurdle that you need to fulfill. Because if you have not actually done steep analysis, they will uh, simply turn down uh, the application for you to propose uh, a new programs or uh, a new short course or anything like that. Okay, so let's have a quick buzz if you like to um, either write in the chat or um, just unmute and tell me what do you perceive as curriculum? If somebody said to you, okay, let's have a curriculum review, let's have a curriculum discussion, what comes into your mind? Can anybody share with me or like to share something with me? Anything in the chat? There's something in the chat? Uh, we have um, the oh, answer to previous yeah. question, the chat. Ada ni, Nur Zatil, uh -huh. curriculum is a course. Uh, I'll take my time. Or a program. Um, assessment. What is taught by instructor and what is a, a course? Somebody said, uh, so uh, so said, B said it is a course of study for students to practice uh, and achieve necessary content. Um, if I rephrase the question like, um, what do you normally do in your curriculum review workshop? Have you been to a curriculum review workshop? A plan? What do you normally discuss when you do your curriculum review or curriculum so-called development at your faculty? A plan, content, including assessment. I can put there. Anything else? Anybody else like to contribute anything? It's a syllabus. Outcome. I like this. Admission. Uh, delivery, graduation, we now we have, um, we have a little bit more input now. From uh, Hong Wei Han, I collected from there. Critical examination of the program, we have examination, so examination. Um, we have to look at the content syllabus to check whether it fulfills the needs of the market as the ultimate goal is to produce employable graduates. Uh, that's from Thiru. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to um, stop here for, for, for the time being and keep um, putting things in the chat box if you like to. Check content. Okay, so do you notice that I actually um, put your um, 
put your response in two columns over here. I put it into column number one and I put it into column number two. And you can see I put a little bit more space so that we can have column number three, I suppose. We can have column number four. Um, and the reason why we actually now go through this activity is because we would like to reframe uh, what we understand by curriculum. And why do I say that we need to reframe? Because um, I think from, from the activity that I always carried out uh, during the um, workshop on curriculum design and delivery, this is, um, this is so-called typical response that I get where Quite a lot of us perceive curriculum as something that what the lecturer does, which is in column number one, right? Uh, you may agree or you may disagree with me. However, when we talk about uh, course, we talk about program, we talk about assessment, we talk about uh, how do we plan the curriculum, we talk about the syllabus, we talk about writing the outcome, uh, delivery, examination, it's all revolved around what the lecturer does, right? If I reframe the question uh, into um, what do you remember uh, about your students' um, uh, life uh, when you were at university? I'm sure I will get a totally different response. Right, but those are similar questions, uh, actually related to what curriculum is all about. If I ask you, what can you remember about your university life? Then maybe some of you will say, will said, I remember the cafe, right? I remember the library where I used to live up. I remember the admission time, okay, how I actually enroll, how they admit me, my experience during dealing with admission. Uh, because I see that one of the participants here, um, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, the Ripada Student Affairs Division. Um, so congratulations, Mr. Harris, if you are if you are in the room. Uh, because when we talk about curriculum, it's it's not all about um academics typically uh, around what the lecturer does. Curriculum involves everybody, involves those in charge of infrastructure, those in, so those from PPHB, for example, they are, they are also supposed to be here, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, how the lecturer like to deliver or to be creative about their teaching is highly influenced by the learning spaces. Although I know in University of Malaya, uh, you have uh, plenty of good learning spaces and you have a dedicated, um, what we call officer and also section in ADAC that take care of learning spaces. Right, uh, so you can see that curriculum is not all about subject, it's not all about exam, it's not all about content. Uh, curriculum, Basically, if I can skip that, it's about students' 24-7 experience, right? So when we talk about students' 24-7 experience, okay, curriculum is also about the learning spaces where they are in during our uh, teaching and learning delivery. So you can see this is this is an example of learning spaces at Singapore Polytechnic, the place where I went for the 10 days curriculum design and delivery training program uh, funded by the uh, Korean uh, government. Um, and you can also um, see here, I can uh, minimize that, um, Typical learning spaces not only have uh, walls where you can stick uh, something up, where you can put your poster up there. Um, 
every island do have what we call a facilities to archive your thought. You also have facilities where you can brainstorm before you actually archive your thought uh, permanently using a computer uh, and um, high definition TV. You can also have a table where you can write on so that during the brainstorming session, uh, you can write something on the table or on a margin paper uh, before you can finalize your thoughts. So this is uh, also actually part of the curriculum. So that is why, as I mentioned, uh, curriculum is not all about the content. It's, it's also about how do, you, how do you deliver the content and in what learning spaces you deliver that content so that the delivery and also your curriculum become uh, highly, highly effective, right? So you can see this is also another example of learning spaces, uh, again, in Singapore Polytechnic. This is just across the room that we were in. You can see there's a cafe and also next to the cafe is a student support center. So you can see that curriculum is not, uh, it's, it's, all, it's also about how do we support students? How do we make sure that students have uh, what they need. So when we talk about what they need, um, students nowadays, uh, with the gadgets and everything, uh, not only they need food, um, but what do you think most important nowadays? If your children going back kampung or go if you choose a hotel for you to be in. So what is the main feature nowadays that you want to make sure available? Wi-Fi, correct. <laughs> Wi-Fi, not only Wi-Fi. I think, I think we are all aware of it because we have, uh, we have gone through these two years of remote online learning not only Wi-Fi, because at, at one point, I had to do my presentation in a car while waiting for my husband at the hospital. Um, and I realized that uh, I do have uh, enough data, but I do not have a plot point for me to make sure that I have enough power for both my laptop and also for my um, uh, phone. Right, so these are all uh, part of um, curriculum. Uh, although they may seem um, unimportant to us when we would like to design and develop our curriculum, because most of the time we are very worried about uh, credit hours, about student learning time, about whether or not our learning outcome is written in a correct manner or not, whether whether alignment is there or not, but. Um, as I mentioned, those are only part of what curriculum is all about. Curriculum is more than uh, what we, 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 we normally often perceive. And especially nowadays, um, we, have been, we have been put in a very challenging situation such that we have to design a curriculum uh, not only having to take care of the uh, construct of the outcome-based education and also the constructive alignment, we also have to take care of the infrastructure as well. Uh, because in this coming uh, uh, semester, second semester of 2021-2022, students uh, in, in all um, university in Malaysia will be coming back um, to the campus. Um, and I think we are all have been uh, uh, told that we have to, uh, whether, whether we've been supported or whether we have not been supported, we have to conduct our classroom in, an, in, a, in what we call a hybrid manner, right? Um, I know that majority of us are very creative about coming up with a hybrid classroom, but uh, as I mentioned, it is not uh, really that easy to design a curriculum for the uh, hybrid environment. So we will look at how we can deal with that, uh, whether you would like to pursue to design your curriculum in a hybrid classroom environment, or whether you would like to uh, focus on delivering your um, curriculum face-to-face -face, um, 
and those who are not with you in the classroom in person, you will put them on what we call substitute blended learning, which ADEC is currently uh, 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 driving an awareness of what substitute blended learning is all about, which I'm going to touch into that uh, a little bit uh, later on, right? So this is uh, very recent. Um, this is the document that I received from the quality, uh, from MQA group, um, from the quality assurance uh, group yesterday. Uh, and the report was released yesterday. So this is very hot. Um, and I can actually, um, let me see, how can I go to another, to another page? Uh, never mind. Um, I can share with you this report, which is quite interesting. It was released yesterday. You can see here, this is, this is one of, uh, this report is actually uh, done by Singapore. Um, if I can show you what the report looked like. Um, this is what the report looked like. Let me share my screen again. Okay, this is this is the report where I show you the um, the data that you've seen earlier on. Right. This is the one. So you can see one of the question uh, in the report said that which country would would be your first choice if you or your child were offered a scholarship to a university. You can see that we are not doing uh, very well as an ASEAN country. You can see that the preference for people to go for their tertiary or higher education is still United Kingdom, still uh, United States being the highest. Um, and surprisingly, the U UE member states are actually doing quite well, actually. And you can see here, uh, there's a lot, a lot more data, interesting data. I will share with you that report. Um, you can see amongst the ASEAN country members, you can see the preference uh, is Singapore at 45.9%, Myanmar 35.1%, Vietnam 34%, Philippines 29.5%, Malaysia 26.7%. <clears throat> uh, for, for, for a person who have done benchmarking study uh, within the ASEAN country, because I've done this in 2013, I visited ASEAN country and see uh, their curriculum, their learning spaces, their support and all that. Um, I, I, I agree uh, and, and, and I really understand why is it that we are not coming up um, better uh, in comparison to other ASEAN countries. Um, as I, I think that is why one of my passion is, is really is really making sure that we, we reframe what curriculum is all about in our mind. Because at the end of the day, when, when students are choosing where they would like to study, um, they also choose in what way that particular uh, uh, region or locality will help me to grow as a person. That is, that is why I mentioned content, subject content, um, the, the, the program, whether the program is highly quality assured uh, or whether the program has been awarded to be the best program or not, uh, that is only one part of the curriculum. However, other parts of the curriculum like Students, um, students accommodation, international students accommodation, uh, about the internet connection, about the uh, admission, about support staff, um, basically support staff, um, it, it's just not good to say support staff behavior, but support staff uh, basically uh, interaction uh, with students and with international students, they all are part and parcel of curriculum. And that is why uh, when we talk about curriculum, you can see here that uh, in COPA, okay, to make sure that we deliver quality curriculum in COPA, 
only section uh, area, we call it area, area one and area two are related to what the lecturer does. Okay, so you can see there are seven areas altogether, used to be nine areas in the previous COPA. Um, out of seven areas, only two areas of curriculum uh, are handled by lecturers, by academic staff. You can see selection of student, academic staff, educational resources, program management, and monitoring and all that, making sure that students are well taken care of this and that. They are all actually part of curriculum, right? Um, I would like to pause there if there's any, anything that you would like to share your experience or, or any input that you'd like to see here. Is there anybody you'd like to unmute? Is that it? So, um, okay. So if there's not yet any input, uh, let us... Let us uh, now look at uh, how curriculum being defined. And you can see here that curriculum come from the root word curare. Uh, and curare is, is about how a horse is actually running from a starting point to the end point. And, and I, think, I think for those who have seen uh, the horse uh, racing uh, a competition or something like that, we, we, we really make sure that the horse is actually uh, focusing on, on the end point. And in fact, the eyes of the horse has been uh, shielded so that uh, the horse won't, will not be able to see uh, elsewhere, right? So here, uh, I have an illustration showing um, what a curriculum is, is all about when it comes to um, education. So what I... what what, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw orang lady macam tu. Okay. Um, and this is the person who's, who's coming in into our program. Okay. And I will draw another orang lady over here. A person who's going out from our program. Right. So the person who's coming in for, uh, to our program can either be students from uh, Pasum or any other uh, matriculation, right? Betul tak? Boleh tak cakap Pasum Malaysia sikit? Is it okay? From S P P M, right? From overseas. Right. Boleh sangat cakap bahasa Melayu pun boleh kan? Okay. Tak ada international staff eh hari ni? Umum? Is it okay kalau saya boleh cakap sikit dalam bahasa Melayu? Okay. So, we we do not have actually a, a lot of choice uh, on who, right? wants to come in although kita punya section kemasukan akan pilih sebenarnya pelajar yang akan masuk Universiti Melayu only uh, cream dia lah cream yang boleh masuk Universiti Melayu however whatever their background is okay we have only if i if i dramatize this a little bit uh, katalah kita offer MQF level 6 right which is a degree program Okay, and it is a four years. Okay, we have this four years that we have with us. Okay, to turn this person who are at that state into a person who's supposed to work with a company or with a certain industry. All right. So we we only have that four years. So when we design our curriculum. Okay, this is when I need to use another paper. Okay. This is the time when we offer the program. This is the time when students graduate. And let's say this is MQF 
six, four years. Okay. When we design our uh, program before students coming in, how long do you think before students coming in, we take to design a program? Anybody like to try? How long do you think that we need? How long do you think the time that we need to design a program? Let's say we would like to offer a new program. Or let's say we would like to review the existing program. How long do you take to design a new program or plan a new program or review an existing program? How long do you think? Roughly, yes. Let me take. Do you have some answers? Two years, two years, five years, five years, five years, two years. Great. Some of you said that it is two years. Uh, I, I, I really uh, love that answers. Um, let's say this is 20, 2022. And let's say lah, memang kita dalam 2022. Let's say this is the year when you have to review your program or this is the year when you would like to offer a new program. So with that idea at the inception stage, it will actually normally take you about two years for you to plan, develop, and uh, put up the uh, advertisement before you before you really begin to offer your program okay where student enroll so if we add two years to that this will be 2024 why is it two years by the way or five years some of you said five years would you like to unmute some of you said that one year, some of you said, uh, Zahira said one, Zahra said one year, Dr. Ravin said it's four years. Why, why do you think you need to take that much of time to, dis, to, to plan and design your curriculum? Can you not do it over, let's say, half a year? Or three months? Or two months? The reason, I think, I think the reason, I think we are all aware, when you like to develop your curriculum, you, you, you have to submit quite a lot of documents and you have to get feedback from um, both QMAC and also ASCP and then you have to do your correction, this and that before you will get an approval, right? So ding dong, ding dong, going um, forward and backward, uh, that will roughly take you uh, one and a half years before you can get an approval, maybe another half a year for you to actually do your marketing before you can really, really uh, start getting your student and you correct, <laughs> Chin. Um, Zara said that if, if it is the whole program to, to be designed, we need two to three years, correct. But for one course, one year will be sufficient to design uh, the approve the to, de to design the approval. It might take a year before we have before we have two years for one course. Correct. So roughly that is the timeline. So we can see that if we would like to uh, review or if we like to design a new program, uh, it normally takes around two years. And then after two years, we will get, we will start to implement the program that we have planned and designed. So if we look at uh, the MPF uh, level six, after four years, then only uh, we produce our first cohort graduate, right? Okay, um, 2024 plus four years is 2020, oops, 2028. 
um, I would like to do another timeline, uh, another point in the timeline. Um, and if we add another, let's say, three years or four years, then only um, we can see that here, if we add another three years, why three years? Because when we collect our so-called PEO, right, it has to be from the person who have uh, worked in that particular discipline for at least three to four years. Okay, so if we make it into four years, 2028 20, plus four years, this will be 2032. Betul ke matematik saya ni? Betul eh? Okay. So all in all, from the inception of uh, we wanting to design or to offer a new program to the person who's supposed to function the way he's supposed to function in the industry related to the, dis to the discipline that we would like to design and offer the program is 10 years, okay? So this is something that we need to put in mind when we would like to design and also develop our curriculum. We cannot design or we cannot actually plan our curriculum based on our experience, our 10 years experience, based on our personal experience. Because we can see here that at the end of the day, this is the kind of graduate that we would like to produce who's supposed to function in 2032. So I would like to uh, get this uh, clear amongst us that, that in curriculum design and development, okay, our thinking will always be future, will always be 10 years ahead from now. So if we are designing micro-credential, look, if we are designing our subject, it's always about what can student do, what can student feel, or what can student think in 2032 when they have gone through my subject, when they have gone through my program. Okay, so if we do not have a clear picture of what 2032 is all about, we're not going to prepare our student for 2032, right? So this is something uh, important for us to take note when we, when we like to design a curriculum. Is there any question at this point? Okay. Um, by the way, um, I have labeled this as program educational objective um, related to this person. Uh, what do you think this person is? This person is described by? I have an answer. Is this timeline applicable to all types of program? Yes, correct. This timeline uh, is, the timeline is applicable. However, uh, the duration uh, of each phase will be different. Obviously, if it's a subject, because the subject is only part of um, this phase, the implementation phase. Okay. Um, although subjects is, at the implementation stage, you still have to make sure that your subject uh, will fit into the bigger picture so that your subject will produce this person at 2032. So your subject cannot be doing something that is uh, backward looking. That is why when we design a curriculum for a program, each and every one of us in the department or in the faculty, those who involved in that particular program offering will have to share the same bigger picture of who this person is going to be in 2032. And that is why we have been 
um, macam mana eh? we, we, we have been uh, uh, ditegur lah eh? oleh talent court baru-baru ni where we have been told that university when they uh, design their curriculum they always uh, forgotten or they fail to uh, envision uh, the talent that they going to produce from their program and this is where this is why we we going to look at how are we going to um, how are we going to predict 2032 Uh, that is why we need to use steep analysis as a tool to envision future and to help us to be very clear and have a visual um, idea of who uh, our graduates going to be in 2032, we're going to go through what we call an industry landscape activity today. Right, so so that's the whole the whole reason why I include those two tools in in our workshop today. May I know uh, there's an there's there's a question from Hyrule. May I know that is the design should be based on what in the future demand is the future demand or what we want the student to be. Thank you, Hyrule. Um, The design will be based on future demand and also what we want the student to be, okay? And this aspiration has been highlighted in our National Higher Education Policy, the NHESP uh, 2015 to 2025. Uh, yang kita panggil dia sebagai triple PMPT. Saya tak masukkan lah. Saya tak masukkan dalam slide saya sebab sometimes uh, ada pula cases kadang-kadang uh, ada yang rasa oh ini old government lah, ini new government lah so I I have removed some of this uh, from my slides. So going back to curriculum, okay, if, I, if we can go through this very quickly, okay, we can see that um, why why is it that we need to know how to plan and also design a curriculum, we need to use uh, specific tools to do it. Because we, we see that curriculum has evolved. This is University of Malaya. I don't know why here, but you can see that previously students okay, um, learn not necessarily in classroom, but they also learn um, and do their work at library. But I'm, 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 I'm I'm very sure, okay, that you are all aware that this used to be a old university library where they cannot talk, they cannot speak to their colleagues, and you can see rows and rows of bookshelves there, okay. However, you can see uh, a huge transformation in how students learn nowadays. And if you compare those pictures uh, with that, this is also University of Malaya. Siapa boleh kenal ni kat mana ni? Do you know where this is? Belakang ni library. Dekat Perdana Siswa kan? Okay, this is a room at Perdana Siswa. Students uh, eat there at the place where they eat and they have their, their lunch and their meals. That is also where they would like to meet their colleagues and do their discussion. That is why I said learning spaces uh, by right should not be isolated Uh, and and there should be uh, nearby cafes or, or where they can actually plug in so that they can make sure all their um, devices, you know, and gadgets uh, can still work. So you can see that uh, in our uh, blueprint, National Higher Education Blueprint, this is what has been aspired before the pandemic because this blueprint has been launched in 2015 uh, and the the The, the shelf life for this blueprint is actually up to 2025, right? And you can see, even during 2015, we have been talking about, we have to move away from uh, this kind of curriculum, okay? Uh, in terms of spaces, in terms of um, teacher-centered uh, approach to teaching towards um, Um, a different kind of learning spaces, not only making huge transformation in the physical learning spaces in UM, um, 
our previous um, Deputy Vice Chancellor Pembangunan, eh, uh, who is currently uh, the Vice Chancellor of USM, has taken up um, the uh, basically uh, ideas uh, put up by the Ministry where we have to actually um, uh, transform our learning spaces. And that is why in UM, there's a cute project uh, and, and I think you are all now supposed to be uh, familiarize yourself and use the cubes as much as possible in order to deliver effective curriculum. But you can see uh, from 2015, we are not only talking about the physical learning spaces. We have been actually uh, telling our academics throughout the country that we need to embrace ourselves for the um, cyber learning spaces. We have been talking about blended learning. We have been talking about MOOC. We have been talking about micro credential. We have been talking about the use of ARVR in 2015. However, I think um, we are all aware uh, when it comes from the ministry, not a lot of people like to so-called follow what the ministry have mentioned. Um, however, um, during the pandemic, okay, we have been um, we have been forced to a certain extent, whether we like it or not, to really embark into something that has been uh, aspired. Um, by uh, our um, government, okay, uh, to what curriculum should be um, in, in future, right? So the pandemic to certain extent has been the, uh, some people call it steroid to what we're supposed to, to, to be doing um, in our uh, teaching and learning. The reason why the ministry has actually um, um, recommended to us to transform from this kind of uh, curriculum to that spectrum of curriculum is because we have been uh, warned uh, many times uh, we, you know, during the engagement uh, with international and also with the World Bank that we have to brace our people uh, for the changes uh, brought by the post industrial revolution. I think we are all uh, very aware about this, right? And uh, we have been told that the future graduates, right, will have to be able to adjust. For example, like nowadays, even bukan graduates saja lah orang biasa pun because of the pandemic, we have to adjust because some of us actually uh, lost lost their job, lost <laughs> not only pandemic. We are talking about flood. We are talking about typhoon. Some lost their houses, lost their uh, their loved ones. So we have been told uh, during that time, although pandemic has uh, were, were not there uh, at that time we have been told that we need to brace our people uh, for the ability to adjust and when it comes to designing curriculum we have been told that we need to consider how we can uh, develop uh, graduates who will be able uh, to adjust uh, and adapt to uh, whatever the future will be right so in response to uh, the World Bank recommendation, because World Bank came to uh, Malaysia in 2017, right? Uh, and with all those uh, uh, evidence-based facts and figures, um, we uh, decided at the ministry at that time, because I was with the ministry at that time, okay, to introduce what we, what we call uh, the fluid of organic curriculum because we know that if the curriculum is fixed and uh, and we do not actually uh, try to develop graduates who can adjust, then uh, they will not be able to survive 2032, all right? So the idea of fluid organic curriculum is to enable us, okay, not to uh, develop our graduate who fit for 2022 or worse still 2012 if we design our curriculum based on our old experience, okay, 10 years back experience. We are supposed to prepare our student for 2032, right? So 
if if we do not allow our curriculum our program to be fluid organic within um just not 2022 and this is 2 years 2024 right 2028 during the implementation phase right during two years i would like to ask you a question what is the duration ataupun tempo untuk curriculum review anybody like to answer that question to respond how often should we review our curriculum what do you think Zara said five years. I'm sure other people agree with Zara. Okay, maybe some of you disagree, but the normal answer that I get, or the normal answer that people give, uh, even when ministry asks the university, um, how often should you conduct your curriculum review? Majority will say five years. Five years. Cuma jawapan tu ada sikit inaccuracy one cohort that is also correct one cohort four years three years four years okay five years actually has been mentioned in one of the document given by um, ministry but the inaccuracy lies where they have missed the word minimum so curriculum review has to be done okay, at least okay or minimum sekali dalam lima tahun so maknanya curriculum review tu perlu dibuat selalulah sepatutnya okay and you can see especially nowadays during the pandemic bayangkan masa pandemik, kalau kita tak review kita punya curriculum, kalau kita tak ubah what we are actually practicing, we, we won't be able to get on with our business, right? So, if we were to wait five years, only we can change the document, only we can change what we are doing. That that is That is not logical. So, that is why the idea of how often curriculum should be reviewed it also need to be reframed because many people said that oh we review curriculum once in every five years or we review only after we finish one whole cohort actually you can do a curriculum review whenever um whenever it is uh needed okay so Lee Yong said three to five years that is also correct okay so in order for us to avoid a uh, curriculum review every year for example right uh, that is also the reason why we should make or we should design our curriculum so that it is fluid and organic what we mean by fluid in, and organic is that in our curriculum we will actually uh, put um, a space let's say this is a four years program um, curriculum we will put some spaces either here 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 or we can use a block system okay uh, here in the four years program where we will offer subjects or we will offer something to students based on what is current during that year. And let's say our students will be in, a, in their fourth year in 2027. So you will offer sets of subjects that is current and relevant uh, which will be identified in 2026 so that you can offer them in 2027. So that is what, it, what we mean by uh, fit organic curriculum. That is one way of how we can design and we can uh, offer a fluid organic curriculum. But I think nowadays, whether you are aware or not, AS, uh, double A, your opinion center, young Prof Yatima used to have is uh, AAS, ASCP, betul tak? Kan? Uh, AS, ASPC. ASP, ASPC. PC, Academic Strategic Planning Center. Yes. So, selalunya ASPC yang akan simak whether uh, you have designed a fluid organic program or not. Okay. You can also embed the so-called fluid organic 
a, a, a so-called feature in your subject as well. Because, for example, people like me who teach engineering, like in my subject, I can actually put two topics uh, float in my subject, and that two topics will can uh, will be. Uh, Will, will, will depend on what is current uh, in, in my subject. So that, that is uh, roughly how uh, fluid, what fluid organic is all about. But in University of Malaya, as I mentioned, the center will determine how uh, uh, you going to actually uh, implement the so-called fluid organic curriculum, whether you realize it or not, but, but it is there. Okay, because uh, all program that has been approved by the ministry must actually now this embrace what we call fluid organic curriculum, or else they won't be uh, getting an approval, right? And the reason for all this re review, frequency of review, and fluid organic curriculum is because I think we are all aware that uh, technology um, are, are developing rapidly nowadays with the fourth industrial revolution and technologies are also reinventing how we work, how we live, uh, and it is also reinventing future jobs. And earlier on, I think uh, Renuka uh, and, and others, and also High Rail has mentioned that when we design our curriculum, do we need to fit the talent that we're supposed to produce or do we fit uh, what do we desire for our student to be? Uh, we have to take uh, into account both and many others. So the many others is something that I would like to uh, share with you. Um, but before I share with you that one, uh, I just also like to uh, let you know that um, our curriculum, when we design our curriculum and when we develop our curriculum, we are not only being impacted by uh, a lot of factors out there, um, uh, we have also uh, been um, basically uh, asked to, to shift from the face-to-face -to, -face to blended to substitute blended learning. Have, have, you, have you heard about this substitute blended learning? To eventually micro-credential. Right, University of Malaya have a very uh, huge uh, team to support you in developing micro potential. So this is also another uh, spectrum on why is it that we need to have a strong uh, fundamental of, of curriculum design because in order for you to um, move yourself from uh, this type of curriculum to this type of curriculum to this type of curriculum and eventually to MOOC or micro credential. Uh, you need to know the basic of uh, curriculum design, right? Uh, because if you are doing um, blended learning and especially substitute blended learning are also more actually um, on top of the normal curriculum design um, uh, so-called process, you will have to embed um, what we call uh, another framework for an online learning. And that framework has been highlighted uh, in your UM online teaching guideline um, where it mentioned about community of um, inquiry, actually. And you can see here that the reason why um, U University of Malaya is, is actually now really um, asking many people to consider developing micro-credential and MOOC from your subject, okay? And this is because there is a trend nowadays where uh, universities are offering bite-sized curriculum to students, uh, stackable, um, and, and also, um, there's also a trend, okay, where employers nowadays uh, also employ those who did not possess university degree, okay, um, and that's that is whether we like it or not, whether we we 
we can argue that this is not really out there. Uh, but you can see here, um, MDEC have shown that uh, there is a paradigm shift in the talent development. And you can see these are some of the evidence that people are now hiring or employing, uh, employing people who do not possess a university degree. And also there is a, there's a, there's a big shift uh, from outcome based to competency based, right? Outcome based to competency based. Okay, so that is roughly what's up there. Saya pause kejap in case there's any question. Ada tak soalan? Okay. Kalau tak ada soalan, is it okay for us to continue or would you like to take a five minutes break? If you need to go to the gents or to the ladies. Macam mana? Nothing in the chat? Kalau tak ada? No. Tak ada eh? Mm -hmm. So kita ada suggestion daripada Chin kita ambil uh, five dulu. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Can we take like five minute break? Okay. And lepas tu kita akan bring you back to what the lecturer supposed to do at University of Malaya. Right? Okay, see you in five minutes. In final year, in final year, kita, lecturer final year kata, oh, majority of students sebenarnya have, have a weaker performance lah in your, in your write-up, <coughs> in the formulation of research question lah ini lah itu. So, kita kena cari sekarang ni, dekat subjek mana sebenarnya in the earlier, in the earlier year yang kita latih dia <coughs> untuk dia belajar write up untuk dia belajar argument. Adakah dalam universiti subjek critical thinking, communication skill? Jadi kalau kita rasa budak tahun tiga, budak tahun empat masih lagi tak boleh uh, buat critical, masih lagi tak tak menunjukkan critical thinking yang sepatutnya untuk level tiga sebab dia dah tak ya, tak boleh menunjukkan critical thinking and problem solving yang sepatutnya sebab dia dah tahun empat. So kita kena feedback benda ni kepada Um, kepada orang yang accountable untuk subjek critical thinking and problem solving di tahun-tahun yang sebelum tu, earlier years. Jadi, daripada feedback ni lah sebenarnya lecturer yang in charge subjek-subjek ni, dia lah yang kena review subjek dia. Kenapa sub? Jadi, dia kena tanya, kena honest lah. Dia kena tanyalah diri dia kenapa subjek dia ni tidak menghasilkan pelajar yang bila dia naik tahun tiga dia able to do this, 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 this. So, curriculum review ni sebenarnya kena dibuat um, kerap lah. Tetapi um, major curriculum review tu yang melibatkan contohnya pertukaran learning outcome Contohnya pertukaran PLO yang melibatkan kita kena resubmit dokumen. Ah, yang itu memang uh, ditetapkan ataupun ditentukan oleh ASPC. Um, yang ini yang kadang-kadang kita jadi rumit sebab saya pernah di UM hari itu. Subjek saya itu memang bermasalah. So bila saya take over subjek itu, uh, apa yang berlaku ialah saya tengok previous student yang result memang bagus. Tetapi bila saya tengok dia punya assessment, dia punya assessment dia tak align dengan learning outcome. Jadi bila assessment dia tak align dengan learning outcome, maknanya assessment dia tak valid. So kalau tak valid, kalau kalau disemaklah secara OBE-nya memang salah lah. Memang tak akan dapat accreditation. Jadi apa saya buat ialah saya alignkan balik semula assessment tu kepada learning outcome. So bila saya buat alignment untuk subjek tu, ramai student pula masalah tak achieve learning outcome. So learning outcome tak achieve. So bila learning outcome tak achieve, saya propose untuk subjek tu di review. So bila saya propose subjek tu review, uh, bawa ke department, bawa ke faculty, bawa ke 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 level universiti, it's been turned down. Uh, ini pun satu hal jugalah. Ini adalah isu proses dalaman universiti. Tetapi kalau uh, dalam dalam workshop ni kita akan address what really need to be done lah rather than me talking about proses dalaman satu-satu universiti lah. 
So sama ada dibenarkan tak dibenarkan tu bergantung kepada ketetapan universiti. Tetapi all I'm saying is that by right, yeah, curriculum review ni for a subject and a program ni should be done dynamic. It, it is a dynamic process. It should be done when whenever needed. Kalau ada masalah, kita perlu address lah. Kita, sebab kalau macam ISO pun, kalau ada masalah, kita memang perlu, kita perlu kita perlu dah wajib kita respon kepada areas of concern itu ataupun kepada what they call um, apa tu NCR lah kalau ISO dia panggil NCR eh non conformance kan uh, non conformance tapi kalau dalam accreditation dia tak panggil NCR dia panggil areas of concern so kita perlu respon kepada areas of concern tetapi takkan kita nak tunggu audit baru kita nak respon areas of concern sebab dalam curriculum we are talking about we are developing talent we are developing anak-anak kita yang akan akan perlu survive pada zamannya iaitu pada 2032 jadi tidak uh, thank you Yong <laughs> um, we were discussing about how how frequent should we review our curriculum Uh, I'm talking from the point of uh, um, the the actual need. Eh? Uh, we were saying that uh, we by right we should review our curriculum frequently and whenever needed. And we have to be honest about our practice. When when we have to review our curriculum, we have to review our curriculum. Uh, just because we have not uh, been allowed to change something, that does not mean that we should continue doing something that is not quite right. Okay, because at the end of the day, it's it's all about our um, so-called amana hmm, to craft this person who's supposed to live uh, in their uh, in their time, uh, which is in 2032. So we have to make sure that we 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 help our children to grow so that they will be able to survive uh, for for the time when when they're supposed to perform uh, in their workspace. I do hope that I I answer your question, Hyrule. Okay, so shall we shall we begin now? Okay, right. So let's uh, let's now bring you back to what what we have to do uh, in the university. Um, and um, before uh, I I share with you how you should do your steep analysis, I just like to uh, share with you um, how. Each and every academic program in Malaysia being approved, and how you get to offer this program, and how you get to teach the subject in your program, right? So you can see um, when when a particular department or faculty at university have an idea to um, offer a new program, okay, at the inception stage, okay. What you need to do is you need to to come up with a draft document. Uh, you need to have a rough idea uh, whether or not you have enough staff. Uh, what the what the new program is all about. You have a rough idea what subjects uh, will be in that program and and so on and so on. Then what you have to do is you will have to uh, what we call present um, your initial proposal. Okay at what they call uh, Mushwarat Saringan Awal or the pre-screening uh, meeting, okay? So what they do in this pre-screening meeting is that um, the uh, Ministry of Higher Education will check whether the program is actually needed by the country. And they will also check whether your program uh, will have enough feed whether it is relevant whether it will sustain whether 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 it, it will not actually um, conflict uh, with the with certain with with, with certain policy um, in the country so that's what that pre screening meeting is all about only after you get the green light from the pre screening committee then only you go and 
fully develop your program. This is when you really need to design according to outcome-based uh, education system. This is when you need to submit the final document to MQA uh, so that you will get the so-called uh, provisional accreditation status. Right, but for University of Malaya, you do not submit yeah, your uh, document when you would like to offer a new program, or let's say after you review existing program, you found out that the existing program is already irrelevant. Therefore, you need to revamp or or so called offer a a, a a brand new program you do not submit your document to MQA because uh, University of Malaya uh, already had a status of SWA University. Yeah? What SWA University is all about is that that particular university has uh, internal MQA inside that university. Only several universities in Malaysia uh, had achieved the SWA status. And UM is one, one of the earliest uh, uh, earliest university got the SWA status because of the strong ISO team there. Okay, So you just submit your document to your uh, centre, ASPC, and ASPC will act as uh, MQA uh, for University of Malaya. Only after you get your provisional accreditation pass, then only you will submit your final document to MOHI for final approval. If you get final approval from your from um, from MOHI, then only the minister uh, himself or herself will sign. Uh, the birth certificate of the program that you propose, then only with this birth certificate, you can actually do your marketing to get your students. Then only after, let's say, six months or a year for you to do that marketing, then only you can actually uh, get your student and uh, basically you can run the program. So that is roughly uh, uh, how each and every program in Malaysia being uh, have uh, each and every program in Malaysia have to gone through uh, this so called uh, process. Okay, ada soalan tak dekat sini? Tak ada. Eh? Tak ada soalan. So you can see uh, dari pada inception stage. So some of you said macam tadi saya ada bagi tahu kan the timeline tu from the inception stage where you would like to offer a new program to the point when your student enroll to, that could take about two to three years. Okay? So let's say this is 2022. So this is 2024. Only 2024, you start your, your program. Okay? And you will be amazed, eh? especially uh, feel like... Um, those people in in contohnya computing uh, faculty okay fsktm okay within that two years too you can see because uh, the technology is actually um, developing so dynamically within that two years there has been uh, a lot of changes going on so you can see by the time when when you have your first cohort coming in to when, when you need to run your program, by that time, some, some of the things that you have uh, planned um, in your four years program has already become uh, obsolete or sometimes can be irrelevant. Okay, so that is when you need to again do a little bit of a review, uh, like uh, what Hyrule mentioned just now. And you cannot just proceed by offering something that you have um, submit two years back. Okay. Uh, at the moment, I am facing that problem because uh, next semester we are supposed to get first cohort of uh, our new program. And when I look at my subject or the document that I receive, I found that uh, some of the some of the content or some of the things are no longer relevant. So I propose for 
some change. But as I mentioned, when you uh, would like to propose some change, um, the uh, you need to get approval from the curriculum committee and some curriculum, some people in the curriculum committee uh, may or may not be open to uh, changes. Yeah? So this is also something uh, that, that uh, uh, affect us uh, as a lecturer. So when we design our, uh, when we plan and when we design our curriculum, these are the main governing bodies. Yeah? So whether we like it or not, our design is highly influenced by them. But then again, we need to have a strong um, understanding and also knowledge on how to design our curriculum. We have to fulfill the directives from uh, the ministry. We have to okay, uh, comply to MQF requirement and we have to make sure that we develop and also we design our curriculum as what it says in the COPA. Right? We also need to uh, basically uh, fulfill requirement from um, our professional bodies if our program is actually accredited by professional bodies like Board of Engineers, Nursing, the double ACSB and, and, and many others out there, right? So you can see um, to make sure that our curriculum um, is, is having uh, quality, all right? Um, we have the ministry that uh, actually govern what we do and we also have MQA that govern what we do. In University of Malaya, they replicate that, that governance where the ASPC okay, play their role or act like the ministry and QMAC play uh, their role as MQA. So, dekat sini lah. Okay, dekat sini. So basically, this is your ASPC dekat sini. So MQA is a QMAC dekat sini. Before your document all go, goes up to the ministry. So, so that's how it is all done. Okay, in order for us to come up eh, at the point of inception, we need to realize that in order for us to uh, offer new program or running the current program, we have to plan, we have to develop, and we have to make sure that we know how to implement and certainly we have to evaluate uh, our curriculum. So this is the basic process of curriculum design uh, and delivery. So if we refer a uh, guideline uh, for good practices on how do we uh, how do we actually design and deliver our curriculum? These are some of the activities recommended in the um, GGP CDD. Panjang, eh? GGP CDD. Guideline for good practices, curriculum design and delivery. Okay, you can uh, look at the MQA webpage and you should be able to find uh, this document there. And this is the excerpt from that document. So do we have to adhere to what it says in the document? For your information, okay, MQA, just now I mentioned that when we want to develop and design our curriculum, we need to adhere to um, some of the MQA documents. MQA documents, we have MQF, we have apa lagi? COPA, we have GGP. But be before COPA, we have standard, and then we have GGP. May I just very quickly uh, ask you, um, what is the level of adherence of MQF? What I mean is, if you do not follow what it says in the MQF, you will not pass your accreditation. You will not get provisional accreditation and you will not get full accreditation. MQF, what do you think? Level of adherence, one or two? What do you think? Anybody? 
you like to type in the chat? Boleh langkah tak MQF? What if we do not follow MQF? Will, will we get a pass? You have an answer? Tak boleh. <laughs> Thank you, Chin. <laughs> okay, memang tak boleh. So for your information, uh, these are basically documents by MQA. MQF and COPA level of, level of adherence is one, meaning that if any part of the document you did not adhere, you langa, you will not get your accreditation. Okay, you will not get a pass. You will fail. Standard. What do you think? Do we need to follow standard? Must we follow standard? What if we do not follow parts of the standard? Can they fail you? Nanti kalau kena audit nanti boleh lah. It is standard is a guideline. Tak boleh. It's okay. Chin said that standard tak boleh tak ikut. Is it like that? <laughs> Am I reading you correct? It is a guideline. No, I, I mean the standard act like a guideline. It's up to you whether you want to follow or not. Is All it? Right. I'm just guessing. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chin. All right. Okay. Standard for your information is written based on COPA. If you look at standard, they actually rephrase, they, they follow exactly like COPA, except that they bring in discipline context. Okay. So you have you have standard program for engineering, standard program for nursing, standard program for architecture, standard program for this, right? So Standard has been written based on COPA with additional example and context in the standards. So whatever that the standard quote from COPA, level of, level of adherence still satu. Tetapi example dalam standard level adherence dua ataupun tak perlu ikut if you do not if you do have a much better practice. So when you read the standard, you have to read it with care because there are some parts of the standard, it says example. I give an example. Huh? Dalam standard yang orang selalu baca salah lah. Sometimes dalam standard, they mention tentang example of the exam have to be 60-40. 60 or 40-60. Or Oh, 60 40. This is final exam. This is continuous assessment. Okay. So if you read very carefully, COPA never mentioned about 40 60 60 40. Okay. But you can find things like 60 40 re re regarding about exam and all that in standard. And normally when it's written in standard, it, it is mentioned under example. So that means that, okay, you can follow this example, but you also has the ability not to follow the example, provided that you have a much better or comparative uh, 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 practice. Okay, so that's what it is. What about GGP? But not for good practices. Sebab sekejap lagi kita nak guna ni GGP ni. Level of adherence. Perlu ikut ke? DGP for your information, guideline for good practices. Ni, okay, you do you do not have to follow. Okay, like like what it says here, curriculum design and delivery. You do not have to follow, provided that you have a much better practice. But if you do not have evidence that you have much better practice, then okay, you are expected to follow the DGP. Am I clear? Okay, I hope I am clear. So in University Malaya, most of the time you will not be uh, uh, you will not be considered failed for not following GGP for GGP CDD because eh, because University Malaya has translated all these activities 
into your QMAC, uh, QMAC punya MQF form. MQF forms. Yang saya kata tadi UM, PT01, uh, lepas tu adalah BR, Zero zero one sampai lah you ada BR zero zero nine from not mistaken, kan? So UM has translated all this into all this form. So we're going to have a look at that as well uh, in a minute. But you can see uh, these are the two sections that we're going to discuss. Okay, um, we're going to look at how do we plan and how do we develop. And you can see in the GGP it mentioned that at planning stage but the first thing that you need to do is you need to convene a curriculum committee um, and you need to assess needs and issues this is where we're going to look at our steep analysis you have to identify key issues such as the mqf levels level descriptors institutional mission vision and also you have to identify trends in the field or study uh, or profession, this is where you need to go through a process of um, of uh, envisioning future. Okay, so I'm not sure whether you are aware uh, that you have done this or not, uh, but but let's let's go through uh, what we're supposed to do at the planning stage. Okay, so when we plan and also uh, develop our curriculum as well. As I mentioned, through our National Higher Education Blueprint, NHESP, and also triple, uh, and also PSPPN, uh, we have been, uh, and also MQF, we have been actually asked to design and also develop our curriculum using the outcome-based education system. And this is roughly the, um, the so-called the, the map for us to use to design our outcome-based curriculum. And the way how do we design and also develop the outcome-based curriculum for an academic program is always top down. It cannot be, you can see the arrow, so it cannot be bottom up or it cannot be at any point going uh, any direction or elsewhere, right? So the design is always top down, meaning that we have to start from the university is, or, or institutional mission vision and we have to formulate our PEO, we have to formulate our PLO, we have to go through this box, uh, which majority of us not paying attention to uh, that, that particular box that I am highlighting here. Uh, then only we have to um, create our so-called course learning outcome. Okay, so... These are all the references that you need to, um, to look at when you would like to plan and also develop your curriculum. Uh, there are a lot more, uh, which I'm going to share with you later on, but this is the main one. Uh, and this is the, the three main one where level of adherence is actually one, one at the top. For uh, just now, I think Renuka mentioned about you would like to get the industry to be part of the curriculum uh, development. Uh, so you would like also to maybe refer to how do we design a curriculum with the industry using the 2U2I method. Uh, you would like to also look at um, the standards as well. Okay, so those are the reference. So let's now look at um, the first steps uh, in the first phase is convene a curriculum committee. Right. Convene a curriculum committee. I would like to find out in, in your um, department, okay, as in you and most of the time you use a department, in your department, um, who is in the curriculum committee? In the first place, in the first place, May I know um, what are the levels of curriculum committee? Do you have curriculum committee at the program level? Yes? Curriculum committee? 
You do? Yes. So you do have curriculum committee at the program level. Right? Um, are you aware that there should be a curriculum committee at the faculty level? Yes. There's a curriculum committee at university level. Yes. There is a curriculum committee at the Senate level. Senate is also a curriculum committee. And above you have Atas Senate siapa? What do you think? Atas Senate. Atas Senate. Yelah. Mohi. Yang JKPT yang saya tunjuk tadi tu. And you can also have under the program level, you can also have curriculum committee at the discipline level. Okay, some of you do have curriculum committee at discipline level. Curriculum committee ni wajib ke? Is it a must to have a curriculum committee? What do you think? Yes. Where it says that it is a must. For your information, curriculum committee is a must. It is actually mentioned in COPA. And in fact, in COPA 2, MKA will check what is the governance of your curriculum committee. This is what we call governance of curriculum committee. Okay, you have a structure. You have a discipline curriculum committee. You have program curriculum committee. You have faculty curriculum committee. You have the Senate as your highest curriculum committee. Finally, you send it to Mohi. Mohi also have a, a national curriculum committee that, that, that we call JKPT, Jatan Kuasa Pendidikan Tinggi. Okay, so let's now zoom into uh, the program level. Okay, program level, because we are going to uh, design and also uh, develop a program. Okay, at the program level, who do you choose to be at the curriculum committee? What do you think? Any of us in the chat? Who do you think is supposed to be at the curriculum committee? Program coordinator, yes, correct. Who else? Who coordinate? Your program coordinator. Anybody else? The HOD, yes. Anybody else you think supposed to be? How do you choose a composition of uh, who's supposed to be in the curriculum committee? Does it based on your BFF? <laughs> Is it based on representative from each discipline? How, how do you think we should choose who's supposed to be in the curriculum committee? What I would like to do here is I would like to share. This is, this is um, what it says in the CDD. Um, and if you check um, UM um, ISO document, you will also see a recommendation on who is supposed to be in a curriculum committee. Okay. So in UM ISO document, Okay, it says that curriculum committee should consist of at least a, a HOD or a program coordinator. So thank you, Chin, for highlighting that. Okay, and you can have members, okay, comprising of a project officer. Why, why do you think that a project officer is actually needed as a curriculum committee? Do you remember the timeline just now for a program up to at least for one cohort to graduate up to the point when we can measure the PEO? We are talking about 10 years timeline. So if we put a lecturer as a project officer, die. 
right? Because there's a lot of document, there's a lot of work. So you need a project officer who can dedicate his or her time to help you to track all the work uh, during the, the whole process of curriculum uh, design and delivery uh, so that um, it, it will be done effectively. Okay, so you can see here there is a, uh, there is a recommendation on who's supposed to be in the curriculum committee such that you need to have a mixture of junior and also uh, so-called seasoned faculty members. Why do you think that we need to have uh, both combination of junior and seasoned faculty members? Why do you think that we need to have such combination? Any of us? Old mind, new fresh mind. <laughs> Thank you, Chin. <laughs> Great to get your input. That is right. We, we cannot choose people who have the same mindset, who have the same, although we're going to create the same bigger picture about our program and who's supposed to be the person that we're going to create in 2032. Right. However, when crafting this person, we need input from various uh, 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 colleagues or people from different backgrounds. So the junior or fresh faculty members may give you input on the latest teaching methodology, technology, this and that, whereas the seasoned members may bring in their wisdom, may bring in um, uh, quite quite a lot of things from, from research that can be embedded into the program or into the subject, right? So you can see here uh, alumni and also uh, uh, industry representatives, okay? Should they be in the curriculum committee or should they be only invited whenever you need them or being an associate? What do you think? Be in a committee, uh, nor as lead, nor as lead we should invite them as a committee members. Okay, any other input? It, it depends, okay, it depends. If, if, for example, after you have done your steep analysis, you found that you will be offering um, a single discipline, majoring in single discipline and you will not be offering it with the industry okay then perhaps you would like to invite them or you would like to um lantik dia sebagai associates okay however if you are thinking of bringing in industry because let's say after you have done your step analysis or the program that you would like to offer uh, do not have the facilities or equipments or machineries on site meaning that in university on layer and you have to place your student um, at the industry then if you need to offer the so-called to you to i curriculum then you have to make sure that in your curriculum committee, you need to have people from the industry as curriculum committee, not invited, not associate, because they have to, they have to be, they have to be roped in um, from the beginning of the curriculum planning and also development, so that they have the ownership of to the program. Okay. So I, I do hope that you, you can see why is it that we need to discuss about who's supposed to be in the curriculum uh, committee. Thank you, Prof, for sharing the information about the curriculum. I have to leave. It's okay, Dr. Farida. Um, we, the recording will be there and uh, I will give you the uh, notes later on. Right. Local and foreign uh, uh, institution. What do you think? Representative from foreign local institution. Should we rope them in our curriculum committee? Again, it also depends. It depends on okay whether you are offering your program. Let's say you would like to 
um, from your STEAM analysis, you have to offer your program half in University of Malaya, half in other countries. Then you will have to have uh, uh, people or representative from foreign institution to be in your curriculum committee. Okay, so I do hope that you will see the needs on, on how do we choose our curriculum committee and who's supposed to be in our curriculum committee. Right, so if we have a uh, we, if we have an idea who's supposed to be in a curriculum committee, what should they do? What is their role? Okay, so you can see here, these are some of the excerpts from COPA, old COPA and new COPA, about the need to have a proper curriculum committee and its governance. Okay, another thing that I would like to highlight about curriculum committee is about the autonomy. Saya nak tanya lah, autonomy ni. Okay. Just now, we have mentioned okay, that um, curriculum committee can be at a discipline level, can be at a program level, can be at faculty level, university level. Okay? So, what are their roles and autonomy at different levels? Are you aware? What are their roles and what are their autonomy? What is it that they can say you can do this, you cannot do this. Who's supposed to say you can or you cannot do this when it comes to curriculum? When to review, when not to review? Whether I can approve what you, you propose to change in your curriculum or not? Okay, in order to give you uh, a much clear idea, okay, I would like to ask you a question. If, if you like to change your teaching methods, Okay, let's say I'm a lecturer. I like to change my teaching methods, how I teach in my class. Okay, do I need to get an approval? What is my autonomy as a lecturer? Are, are you clear about your autonomy? Any response? No approval needed. Thank you, Norzatil. Okay, what if I want to change my assessment in my subject? What is my autonomy? Chin said, how different is the composition of members for different level of curriculum committee? How, how different is the composition? The composition differ at a different level uh, because it's, it depends on the nature of the discipline. Right? So going back to what you can change and what you cannot change, I would like to discuss with you a little bit on the autonomy. For your information, in outcome-based education, when we, when we plan and develop our curriculum, we have to make sure everybody is involved and we have to make sure that everybody has the right to contribute, to say things, to propose changes, to do what, what they think best for us to develop the talent that we're supposed to develop for 2032, right? If autonomy being taken away from lecturers, katalah semua benda, let's say everything has been decided by the faculty or by ASPC, okay? The lecturer will not have so. Tak ada mood nak mengajar lah, okay? And uh, this, is, this is a big problem. Okay, this is a big problem. So you can see here, this is one, this is actually University Malaya document. Okay, this is actually from the Faculty of Engineering. Um, you can see the Faculty of Engineering was uh, trying to explain to everybody, to all lecturers, your autonomy. Okay, and faculty's autonomy. Okay, and also department or program level autonomy. Okay, and in here, how we should read this document is that you can see that anything written in yellow, something like this, okay, are those items that can be, can be changed, okay, by lecturer if they like to propose a change, okay. The approval will be given by the level uh, indicated by the color of the box, 
the color of the box. So you can see here, as a lecturer, I was told okay, that I can actually propose changes to learning strategies. I can propose changes to assessment as long as it is aligned to learning outcome. However, if I want to change any of these, I need to get approval at faculty level, right? Approval at faculty level. So that is how they communicate the level of autonomy amongst lecturer, amongst, uh, um, amongst the, the curriculum committee at the faculty level and also at the um, departmental level. So you can see when it comes to outcome, okay, you can see who can propose changes. Only coordinator can propose the changes on your behalf. So if you would like to change the learning outcome, let's say you have tried um, uh, uh, many, many times um, different strategies of um, learning, you have uh, tried many uh, other types of assessment and the learning outcome still not achieved, so you can actually propose changes to the learning outcome. But when you want to propose changes to the learning outcome, your coordinator at the program level will have to bring it up for you. And the approval need to be brought up to the Senate level. So that is how the different uh, level of autonomy being communicated uh, amongst lecturers at the Faculty of Engineering. This document was shared with me uh, many, many years ago. I don't know whether this practice uh, has been around in, in your faculty, but all I'm saying is that it is very, very important uh, in our curriculum design, especially using the outcome-based education, for us to know what is it that we can do, what is it that we cannot do, who approve, who, who approve at what level. Okay, so these need to be very clearly communicated. The reason for this is because if you look at outcome-based education, this is the 20-32% that we would like to develop. Okay, We have seen clearly this person. And we're going to develop this person in four years. Year one, year two, year three, year four. Through, let's say, 10 PLO. PLO 1, PLO 10. So you can see your subject, okay, for example, over here, is just one piece of that bigger picture. So, so if you do not play your role well, or if you change your learning outcome, ikut suka hati sajalah, okay, you will not be uh, helping your, your, your department to create the correct bigger picture for 2032. So that is why it is important to have curriculum committee that understand and clearly know their role and also their autonomy so that that bigger picture will be well formed uh, in, uh, as what has been planned. Okay, so that is, that is about curriculum committee. Ada soalan tak? Untuk curriculum committee? Kalau tak ada, I would like you to uh, scan the QR code. From this point, you need a lot of references and material in order for us to proceed with how do we predict the person for 2032. Boleh dapat ke bahan? Let me know if you if you can or you cannot get the material. Dapat eh? Okay, so dapat. Okay. Uh, this is a link to Google Drive. I I put there several uh, references uh, and also um, basically PowerPoint slides from what we used to call it taklimat guna tenaga for us to predict future. 
Okay. And nowadays they rebrand it and they call it forces, foresight or future talent or something like that. Okay. So let's let's move on. If you uh, have already got the material and the PowerPoint is also in there. Okay, you should be able now to uh, look at the PowerPoint in your mobile devices or in your own devices. In case what you seen through Zoom is, is not really that clear. Okay. So let's now look at how do we assess needs and issues. Okay. So before, remember about the timeline. When we when we have an idea, okay, to offer a new program, or let's say we have we we review, we would like to review our program inception. Or review 2022. How do we how do we know whether our current program is still needed? How do we know whether the new program that we would like to offer is needed? Okay. Is it possible to share the link on the chat, please? Um, Umu, boleh, boleh tolong? Boleh tolong letak link tak pada chat? Boleh tak saya share sebentar, ya? Yeah? Okay, Dr. Jacob, I think I think Adat will... Okay, some of you said that how do we determine whether the program is needed or not? We do a market survey. So, thank you so much. Um, Tiru, market survey is good, but it's not good enough. If you go up to the ministry and when you defend your proposal to offer a new program and you said that, okay, I've done a market survey from the market survey, it is indicated that this new program is highly needed because so and so and so and so. Okay, normally your proposal will be turned down. Okay, because market survey is only one source of data. That is one thing. Okay, another thing is market survey is known to be inadequate in foresighting. Okay, you may agree or you may not agree with me. However, all I'm saying is that if you bring in your proposal to the ministry and you only show that you have, you have done your market survey, your proposal will definitely be turned down. Okay, so normally uh, the ASPC will make sure that you do more than a market survey. Okay, so let's look at what we can do. Okay, and why is it market survey is inadequate? When you go up to the ministry, okay, uh, after you have reviewed your program, your existing program, or, or if you would like to offer a new program, okay, you have to be able to answer these questions, okay? If you cannot answer these questions, then forget about taking it up and apply for approval uh, at the screening level or even approval at the final level, at the ministry or even at the ASPC, right? First of all, we need to be able to answer where are you going to get your feeder? Who's going to be coming in into your program? that you are reviewing or that you are going to offer in 2024, okay? So you need to be able to identify where, you can, where you're going to get your feeder, okay? So your feeder can be STPM students, can be what students from PASU, can be, I don't know. But if you said that your feeder is going to be from PASU or from STPM or from matriculation, the question is, do you know how many of them are in the system now? And how many of them are going to be in the system in two years' time? In three years' time? In four years' time? Because, remember the timeline just now? Okay. This is us applying for approval. By the time we offer our program, it's 2024. 
if we said okay there are plenty of students uh, who's going to finish pasu so and so and they will be ready in 2024 we're going to get like 40 60 students enroll in our program at that time can we guarantee that we can constantly get 40 50 students or 60 students up to 20 28 Therefore, we need to find out where are we going to get our feeder. We need to ensure that we're going to get our feeder. We cannot be saying that okay, because Pasum now have plenty of students. Therefore, in two years time, we're going to get forty students coming in into our program, and suddenly in twenty twenty six, we do not have anybody coming in into our program. So we need to make sure that when we actually uh, design and and want to develop our program. First of all, we need to make sure that we know who is our feeder. Where are we going to get our feeder? Will our feeder be the local student? Will our feeder be international student? Will our feeder be ASEAN student or a combination of both? Okay, so this is something that we need to think about, and you can be asked during the session where you present your new program proposal uh, at the ministry or at the ASP ASPC. Another thing is some of you mentioned that we want to develop a program where we want to make sure that our student will be able to work in the related industry. So the question that you will normally be asked is that where are your graduate going to work? Okay, which industry? Bawah industry ada banyak company kan? They don't actually ask. Okay, the problem with the market survey ialah when you do your market survey, you normally survey companies who often take your graduates, and you also survey um, students who you think will take your program, right? And normally the answers given by companies and also all these potential students that coming that that you think would like to take your program will be always yes, okay? But when you go up. And defend your proposal to the ministry. First of all, they will ask you what will be the grade of um, uh, position that your work, that your graduate will resume when they uh, completed the program that you would like to offer. So you need to identify ada tak perjawatan di JPA grade berapa? Okay, if there is no job in the government sector sector for example there is no post in the government sector right you need to be able to mention okay the typical posts or jobs available in the industry related to the discipline that you're going to offer okay beritahulah company apa nama position apa salary berapa and all that okay so you need to do that okay And you need to also find out whether what you would like to propose is also um, recognized by any professional bodies in that discipline. And also another thing that you need to do uh, at the planning stage is for you to check whether the program that you're going to offer or the program that you have re- that that you would like to propose after you have done your review. Have an overlapping initiative. So, what do we mean by overlapping initiative? You need to find out around you, especially UM. Eh? Dalam lembah kelang saja ataupun dekat selangor. How many university do you have? Okay, you have a lot of university around you. You have UKM. You have uh, um, UITM. You have University Selangor Swasta. We are talking about both private, private. <laughs> Uh, and also public university plus university daripada luar negara lah. Okay. So you need to check whether they are also offering same program. And normally, uh, before, the, when when you go to the ministry to defend uh, your new program or the program that you have reviewed, okay, all this data, okay, uh, dekat ministry sebenarnya dah ada. Okay. So, bila kita when we type the name of your program uh, from uh, the system okay the ministry can actually get a list of all similar programs to what you are proposing okay and from there we can see uh, also we can check the ministry can actually check 
whether these programs are actually popular, whether uh, uh, you, they get uh, good enrollment every year or not, um, whether this this program has been you know uh, sustainable uh, all these years. So before you before you basically make a decision whether to offer this new program or whether you you would like to offer this rev- new new version of your review program you need to check these so called overlapping initiatives okay um and when when you check overlapping initiative you must also be able to answer for example let's say uh in in um okay um is also offering um uh, 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 a pro um, a medical program, right? It's also offering engineering program. It's also offering um, pure science program. Okay, and we also some of you are actually from law, um, from the faculty of uh, architecture, built environment. You can see that programs that you are offering are also offered by UKM. Are also offered by UPM. Okay, so you need to uh, be able to defend and identify, okay, if other people around you are also offering the same program, in what way your program is different, okay? So these are some of the questions that you need to have an answer um, before you even uh, send your document uh, for for approval. Let me take a question, is it? Bukan question. Okay, just a link. Okay, so that is overlapping initiative. Duplication in the region, uh, implication on resources. For example, if you said, especially nowadays, uh, I think you are all aware, um, all the pendanaan has been cut. Okay, it's a budget cut to all universities. So if you said that, okay, we would like to offer this new program or our review program, uh, need uh, extra lecturers or need extra infrastructures, need extra machineries or equipment, you can forget about it because as, as soon as you mention that there is a financial implication to your uh, proposal, <laughs> the proposal will be turned down. So that is why you must make sure that the new program that you would like to design or offer will not have financial implications. How can we do that? The question is how can we do that? Okay, you can do that as I mentioned by after you have done your state analysis by either considering doing it with other university who has the facilities or with industry through to you to I so that you can send your student to use the latest machineries or latest technology. Okay, or you can do it with are your international partners who can give your students a, a, a totally different experience with, it, with, with everything that you do not have, okay? So these are some of, the, some of the ways how you can design or you can develop your curriculum uh, when you are having difficulties in balancing the kind of uh, graduate that you'd like to produce for 2032 and the lack of resources that you have in, uh, for example, in your institution, in University of Malaya. Okay, so, so these are some of the uh, things that you would like to consider as well at the planning stage. Okay. Should we think of chat? There's something in the chat. Thank you, Umu. Okay, that's good. So there's, there's only a link in the chat. Okay. Um, at the planning stage as well, what you need to make sure is you need to make sure that the program is also in support of, uh, this is just like an FRGS application. You have to make sure that you know uh, which policy that you are supporting, uh, whether it is supporting the SDG or the uh, RMK12. Uh, and you must also say that it is actually now the program the program is actually addressing the trends in the field and also what is needs in the profession and so on and so on. Okay, so these are some of the points that you need to consider at the planning stage. So how are you going to get this, all these points and the answers uh, before uh, you can write it properly um, in your document? or before you go up to the uh, ministry, or Prof. Yatima used to defend on your behalf at the ministry, you know, uh, on all uh, 
to to all this um, concern or, or consideration that you have done. So this is when you can actually uh, use what we call the steep analysis tools. Okay, so that you will be able to envision future and you will be able to get answers to some of these questions that uh, we have uh, gone through uh, at this uh, particular uh, PowerPoint. So what is steep analysis? Natasha, may I ask uh, questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I just want to, can we go back to your point of consideration just now? Mm -hmm. So you just, just would like to get some tips uh, when, uh, about uh, what you write when we're talking about a comparison between uh, our program with uh, existing university or, or different university that are also offering the same program. Because uh, I'm just wondering, uh, usually uh, from your experience, what else can we say in terms of how your program differ from you know existing programs from other universities that also offer the same program as you mentioned just now? Because uh, I'm in dentistry, so sometimes we know that uh, we have to compare to the standards. All universities are using mm. that standards to follow. Yeah. <laughs> so we just want to know. Sometimes I also have to struggle to say uh, the comparative part, kan? Because, yeah. uh, because they don't show us the modules. I don't know standard yang sama, kan? Betul tak? Yeah, so I think I struggle a bit uh, when we prepare that part. So I'm just wondering, uh, what is your tips even doing that, you know, when we try to highlight our strength of the program, which actually already offered by at the university mm. as well. Do, do you know that when you, when you refer to this book, okay, you have to write this down, not only uh, based on your uh, benchmarking with the local institution, you also need to write that down after you have done benchmarking with international institution, foreign institution. Lupa deh kan? Dalam buku ni memang ada sebenarnya. Kalau you tengok ada dua borang dekat dalam buku ni. If you if you can open up this book, it's in your Google Drive, the JPT book. Okay, just that that book there. Let me see tadi. Ah, buku yang ni, buku yang ni yang yang Prof Yatima jadi chair when I was at JPT ni. If you open up that book, okay. Um, if you look at page sixty one, okay. If you look at page 61 and above, you will be able to see that you will have to um, write up perbandingan. You look at page 64. You look at page 64. Are you with me? If you look at page 54, look at item 25. Perbandingan dengan program akademik Universiti Luar Negara. Item 24, perbandingan program akademik yang dipohon dengan universiti lain dalam negara, pertindihan program. Nyatakan program yang sama atau hampir sama di universiti yang lain. So, you see, this is when you have to be honest lah because JPT have all this list. So, you have to to make sure that your list match with JPT punya list lah. List. And then second point, if you look at 24.2, nyatakan persamaan perbezaan kekuatan program akademik yang dipohon dengan program universiti yang lain di dalam negara yang dibandingkan. Okay. This, your, your strength. So you need to determine your strength. What, what can you talk about your strengths? You am being a research university. So you may say that you are embedding inquiry-based learning in your curriculum. In a problem-based university, for example, the Albok, the cut, the cut, uh, Denmark, Albok University, for example, Singapore, Singapore have one uh, problem-based university. All programs in the university are delivered. Ni bukan subject, eh? Programs. All programs are delivered through problem-based learning, through problem-based uh, a concept. Okay. Currently, UMP, for example, the reason why we got most of our new programs approved by GPT is because all our new program nowadays are delivered through project-oriented problem-based. 
meaning that every cohort will get a project that they have to do throughout the four years, making use of all the subjects that they will learn throughout the four years. Nampak tak? The, that is the strength and the, the uniqueness about the program. Although other people are also offering the same program. Okay? So you need to find in what way your program will be different from other people's program. So you can say in terms of um, how you deliver it, in terms of structure. Okay, for example, you have a different structure because nowadays, semalam baru keluar newspaper, or dua hari lepas baru keluar newspaper, Taylor's, no, Sunway. Yeah, Sunway. Sunway University of Malaysia work with Australian University. Now, they are offering their program through what they call a block system. So as if those from medical are familiar with the block system, but your block system is slightly different. Okay. What do we mean by block system? Sekarang, for example, if you read, I can, I can share with you later on eh, the link, newspaper cutting. Uh, student, dalam block system nowadays, what student does is, normally for each semester, student will learn, uh, uh, will, will take five subjects, right? Will take around five subjects. But when the university said that we are now offering our curriculum in a block system, that is why you should come to Sunway and learn and take our program. So our program is unique. Their block system works such that, okay, students take five subjects. However, they learn uh, each subject in a block. For example, I take subject A, B, C, but I take subject, I learn subject A comprehensively within first four weeks. Okay. Maknanya first four weeks, so I don't do any other subject except subject A. So that I can focus, I can day in, day out subject A. Then I do subject B the next four weeks. And then I do subject C the next four weeks. It is focus block oriented kind of curriculum. So nowadays this is a trend for people to do that as well. Or you can mention that the, 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 in, in a way we, our program is different because we have uh, uh, industry placement uh, that is cumulative in nature. I don't know. Or oh, you have a joint uh, um, uh, placement with uh, overseas university. So there are many ways on how you can design your curriculum so that your curriculum is different from the one that you are comparing, either locally or uh, internationally. Siapa yang tanya tadi ya? I did not get your name. Dr. Azlida, is it? Thank you, Dr. Aisha. Kira now. Yeah. So, I think, I think we can do that. We can structure based on method. Um, hmm. we, we, okay. All right. Thanks, Dr. Aisha. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, and you can also actually mention that some of your programs maybe uh, will be delivered through micro credential. Okay. And some of your, some of the things that you do in your program will be delivered by, I don't know, by the uh, actual industry partners. So these are the main, um, contohnya macam programs in UKM, especially in your uh, business school, kan? They are marketing their programs such that they said that uh, most of their uh, subjects in the programs are actually delivered by the actual mm. practitioner or the pro out there. Um, so this is this is the selling point. This is how your program is, is really different and how your students are actually working with to, in order to, to, to get the, the, the subject, the students are being put in a real uh, working scenario. So this is also something that you can consider in, in making your curriculum or designing your curriculum differently from others. Okay, so let's go back to the step analysis. Uh, as the name implies, you can see S actually stands for social demographic, if I can blow this up, okay. Stand, uh, S stands for social demographic component, T for technology, E for economic, second E is for environment and nature, and P is actually political and legal. Okay, and as I mentioned, when you will be able to uh, answer most of the uh, questions in the JPT book, 
the document that you need to submit just now for you to apply for a new program or program that you have revamped or reviewed after you have done the steep analysis. So before you have done the steep analysis, I think you will have a, a bit of a struggle to actually filling in uh, uh, those uh, uh, areas uh, being um, uh, being asked by um, by the by, by basically by the forms uh, in the application process. Okay, so let's look at how we uh, what the social demographic uh, it's all about. Okay, uh, in the social demographic area, we need to actually um, we need to actually indicate. Uh, who is out there? Uh, this will allow us to identify feeder, all right? Because at the end of the day, if we do not have enough people to come in into our program, so about the Malaysia, ada dua puluh public university more than five hundred IPDS. So bayangkan to tak campur lagi dengan sekarang ni with the COVID and everything, it's big. Um, there's no boundary. There's no boundary. Anybody can enroll to any university. Okay, so we we so the issue of feeders and eh, it is not is not uh, something we can take lightly. We cannot nowadays. Huh, bukan macam dulu dulu kita boleh design kita punya curriculum mesti ada orang masuk tak. Because you have seen just now eh, the data yang saya tunjuk released yesterday questions where uh, they said that if you have money to send your students or to, to send yourself or to send your children uh, to go to university, which country <laughs> that that you prefer uh, to spend your money on. Eh? You can see ASEAN countries is, is, is not the favourite. Yeah? And among the ASEAN country, Malaysia pun sebenarnya tak, taklah tempat yang favourite orang nak hantar. Jadi isu feeder ni sebenarnya is is critical because why am I saying that is critical because World Bank actually have shown data in 2017 as I mentioned to 2016 that okay our that the world birth rate is going down okay Malaysia Singapore is also having the same problem, okay? Kita dah tak banyak orang muda dah sekarang ni, okay? So who, who is going to fill up our university? So we need to be very careful. So if we cannot get the local to fill up our university and, and, and taking up our program, who is going to fill up our program, okay? Uh, for for private university, this, this is even more crucial. If they don't do steep analysis, if they, they don't identify their feeder, eh? If they cannot find anybody enroll in their program after it's being offered within two years, okay, then they will be fine. If, for example, they offer their program and suddenly after two years or after the first year, they have to close shop because nobody enrolled. Not only public university will be fine, their license can also be retracted. However, for public university like UM, you know, walaupun license kita takkan ditarik ataupun kita takkan define, okay, sebab, sebab kita punya funding daripada ministry. However, we have to remember that um, the public money, okay, and our responsibility is there for us to make sure that our program is sustainable and also relevant. So, social demographic data will help you to identify Who's gonna be where? It, who who's gonna be our feeder? Where are we gonna get our feeder? If our feeder is not coming from Malaysia, uh, are they coming from ASEAN country, or are they coming from other parts of the world? If so, what is their what is their persona? <laughs> okay, how do they learn? What is their culture? So those will affect how you design your curriculum. Okay, so the so social demographic data is is very very important in here for you to recognize uh, who going to be the one who's going to go through the uh, curriculum that you design. Okay, and eventually you you have to turn this person uh, to be the person of twenty thirty two that you have um, uh, envisioned. Okay, technology. Okay, technology, this is, 
now 2022. So we cannot assume that whatever that we have, technology that we have now will be like this uh, and will not change by 2032. So we need to find out in what way the technology will evolve and what kind of technology will our graduate be using when they work. And we have to prepare them for, for, for them to work with that new technology. For example, eh, like in my field and in medical and in dentistry, even in built environment, naming, <laughs> in languages, the rising of ARVR, say nak tanya dengan you all, eh? Are you, are you preparing your student for this? The rising of ARVR? Sekarang ni, for example, uh, like in civil engineering, if my student want to check whether the construction is done correctly or not, what they need to do is they just need to put on the uh, um, VR, get, uh, um, what we call a headset, and they will be able to see which part of the building is not being constructed correctly or incorrectly, right? So similarly with dentistry, with medical, ARVR has been used for, for, for quite some time now. In languages, now you have a, a mobile phone that can, uh, that can speak for you in a different language. Right, uh, and you can see that, um, for example, like uh, nowadays, um, even hospital are now now working with with many machineries and robots, and with with the COVID nineteen, there's there's a lot of technology being being developed for that. So, in twenty thirty two, I am very sure that the way how our graduate work will work with totally different than what we are experiencing now right so <clears throat> this is also that that is technology what about data analytics okay with with the mobile phone with the internet with the computer with the 5g and don't know how many g coming coming up okay there are plenty of data all right. How do we prepare our graduate who's supposed to function in 22 with this massive data? Okay. Data and meaning, making meaning out of that data is more important than having a data. If you have data, but you cannot make meaning in that data, there is no use to it. Okay, there's nothing that you learn from that data. So data analytics is also something that perhaps you would like to consider because of the um, increased um, development uh, in the technology. Then what we need to do in the state analysis, we need to also consider the economics in what way the economics will actually change uh, the way we live, the way we work, and environmental and state. Nampak macam tak ada kaitan eh? environmental and state. What is the current environmental issue, do you think? Anybody? I didn't make a chat. Environmental issue. Climate, correct. Nurzatil, thank you so much. Kan baru ni, flood, reboot. Macam-macam lagi lah apart from the uh, virus, viruses eh. So, in what way all this environment change has an impact to your um, to your program? Okay, nampak macam tak nampak macam tak ada kaitan sebenarnya ada kaitan. Okay? So you need to find a way in what way the environmental uh, and and nature change uh, will 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 give an input to how different you should design your curriculum. Political and legal. Political and legal. Uh, for example, what is the um, what is the national aspiration? Uh, in what way the world is evolving? When you refer to the SDG and all and all that. So those are some of the things that you need to consider during the state analysis. So when you are 
gathering all this information, this is just like a mini research to you. Then you can list all the opportunities and challenges and you can see whether or not um, your program is actually uh, needed uh, in future and what kind, if it's needed, what kind of talent, okay, uh, competency that they should have in order for them to function in 2032. So that is what state analysis is all about. Huh? So this is an example of um, <clears throat> how the state analysis template has been uh, filled up. And for your information, in order for you to fill in uh, all the STEEP uh, box, obviously you need to... Um, to get some data, okay? And these are basically the sources of data. And that is why I am sharing with you a folder uh, called Forces 2020, 2021, right? And in that folder, you have um, basically original slides uh, from the briefing given by some of these uh, agencies that help us to foresight and help us to fill in the um, steep uh, analysis boxes. Uh, however, uh, for some boxes that you do not have uh, this data, you need to find it from the web pages and uh, resources from the internet. So apart from, apart from those as a source of data, you can also refer to uh, some of the guidebooks from the ministry, either through the uh, Triple PMPT or this particular book, which uh, talks about what the future will be for Malaysian higher education. Um, you can also look at the previous uh, year's uh, slides for Taklimat uh, Kunia Tenaga Forces. If you scan those uh, QR code, you should be able by right to get the previous uh, slides uh, on how we can use those data for foresighting uh, purposes, All right? So this is just an example, an excerpt from some of those slides that I mentioned to you. You can see this actually from the World Bank uh, in 2017, although this 2017 is still applicable nowadays. We can see, as I mentioned just now, uh, when we look at social demographic data, even World Bank has mentioned that Malaysia is also actually experiencing declining birth rate. You can see it's going down. Uh, Negara Manua is going up. And orang yang dalam umur bekerja is about this. But if you like to get a more accurate data, you should refer to uh, Department of Statistic Malaysia yang baru saja habis banci. Or you can actually refer to Ilmia Penyelaman Web because Ilmia is uh, an agency under the Prime Minister's Office that uh, do all this research uh, on on uh, on where the, the country is supposed to be heading uh, so that uh, the, so that we can be living in a, in prosperity. This is just an example excerpt again from all those slides. So I'm just going to go through with you very quickly. Okay, you can also check the cut my future jobs. The cut my future jobs. There are plenty of indication of what kind of jobs, what kind of discipline are there needed by Malaysia at the moment. Okay, so you. You boleh tengoklah sama ada your program is actually uh, will will be helping to to feed to become the feeder for 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 the jobs uh, available in Malaysia. So you can see uh, by industry, uh, this is this is the current status of the jobs. Eh? Uh, manufacturing, okay, uh, have a lot of vacancies at the moment, but we don't know whether in 2032 there will be a lot more vacancy in uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, however, uh, you can use this data and you can uh, what we call do uh, a comparative and also do a trail uh, with another data. Uh, Daripada, for example, um, you, you can look at RMK12, see where the manufacturing is still up there. If it's still up there, you can, you can see that not only we need to address the current uh, vacancy, but it is it's going to be there for quite some time and it's going, it, we can guarantee that, uh, you know, the, the talent is, is highly needed by the country by 2032, right? Okay, uh, 
another important document that you need to refer uh, when you would like to find out whether the program is highly needed or not is you need to refer to what we call the coal list, C-O-L. Okay, at the ministry, this is the list that they normally ask you to refer to. Okay, so coal list is actually um, developed by Talent Corp. Okay, this is also another agency under the Prime Minister's office uh, where they study, they are making use of uh, data from DOSEM, from ILMIA to actually uh, find out uh, in what way we can develop the correct talent for Malaysia. Okay, so in the call list, you will be able to see um, what are the uh, talent needed in, in Malaysia now and in future. Okay, so normally when you, when you present your proposal for a new program or reviewed program to the ministry, they will normally ask you, have you referred to the call list? can you actually tell us the Moscow code from the code list? So make sure that you refer to this document, okay? So there is a Moscow code in the code list. Tengok Moscow code dia ada tak dekat situ? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, if, you, if you check uh, the Moscow code in the code list, you should be able to, to, to get it, okay? So if you go back, to the um, what you need to fill in hmm, in the uh, new programs um, proposal, you will be able to see that um, you need to include all this information um, in, if you look at page 62 from this book, okay, this information need to be in, uh, in box number 17. In box number 17, you have been asked to justify, justifikasi mengadakan program akademik. Okay, so this is where you need to justify based on the needs analysis that you have done. So you cannot just uh, uh, give your justification based on the market survey. You need to include your market survey and on top of your market survey, you need to uh, uh, tell uh, or write here that you have referred to uh, in fact, dekat dalam sini, you boleh tengok eh. Uh, it says in the in 17.2, jenis pekerjaan yang berkaitan dan jumlah keperluan industri hasil dapatan labor force survey. Daripada sini lah. Okay, hasil dapatan daripada labor force survey. So, you need to um, to to make sure that you have uh, referred to this, this, this document. Okay, verbally, they will ask the Moscow code from you actually okay so apart from that okay you may want to refer to data from ptptn um data ptptn ni normally okay for your information dekat mohi eh, the highest curriculum committee is jkpt again eh, as i mentioned to you so normally representative from ptptn is there so in what way we can use their data if PTPTN said, if let's say you 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 would like to offer a new program, okay, and uh, PTPTN said that, okay, program ni biasanya lah daripada kita punya data, student tak bayar balik. So, what does that indicate? What do you think? Anybody like to try? Yes. Cheers. <laughs> Student maybe tak dapat kerja ataupun tak ada kerja. Okay, so so not only you have to list uh, dekat dalam uh, section 17 just now, okay, about graduate employability status of your program, previous cohort. You must also check uh, at least with PTPTN or any funding bodies that used to be with your with your faculty or with, with the university. Uh, what is the status of uh, bayaran balik pelajar lah kepada semua hutang ataupun dana-dana yang diberi kepada pelajar. Yes, because that will give an indication for the students actually get a job. Because the GE data, uh, it, it has a component of uh, students pursuing for postgraduate or for the study. Okay. 
so so that is that is why we also actually uh, validate with uh, PTPTN and also with other funding bodies. Tiru kata, or they choose not to pay. Paying that is <laughs> less in priority list. Maybe, maybe, but um, but GPT is making use of their input when approving uh, new programs or reviewed programs. Yeah. So I do hope that you you will be able to balance um, how you see things. So similarly, um, we can actually use um, data from other uh, agencies, for example, from MDEC, if you are offering something digital or non-digital discipline. So but, um, nowadays, eh, I think you're all aware, even uh, advertisement in the, in the television talks about Malaysia is heading for digitalization era. I'm sure University of Malaya has your, your own roadmap, how you would like to transform the university towards uh, digitalization in five years time. Okay, so make sure that your program that you are planning now or you are reviewing now, taking into account the transformation uh, currently um, developing in 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 creating digital talents, okay? Um, as I mentioned, our graduates in 2032 will work in a totally different environment, okay? They will work with technology. Um, even communication nowadays, we are no longer talking about one of our graduate attributes is communication skill. Now we are talking about digital communication skills, right? Um, so similarly, with other uh, soft skills and other attributes as well. So the, so the element of digital need to be considered in your curriculum uh, uh, design and also development. Okay, so those are basically an example or excerpt on how do we envision what's going to be in 2032. Let's say, okay, you have conduct your state analysis and you have clearly identified okay, that the program is needed and you have clearly identified what are the competencies and also skill the 2032 person that you're going to craft. Okay, then only you can actually make a decision okay, on certain things. Only after you have done your step analysis, you can make a decision whether to offer or whether not to offer uh, the new program that you have in mind. Or if you are reviewing a program, whether you would like to stop the current program, whether you like to um, uh, come up with a new program after you stop a new program, or whether you would like to re-offer the new program with... Um, major curriculum review, uh, it all depends on uh, what your data is actually telling you after you have done your steep analysis. Maybe your current program okay, uh, is relying on the local um, feeder. And after you have done your steep analysis, you found that uh, you can no longer rely on the current feeder. Saya rasa banyak universiti, eh, especially during the pandemic ni, memang struggle, especially postgraduate program. Um, memang, memang number of students is actually going down. Okay, so if if you have problem with a feeder, okay, then you need to find out, okay, uh, how is it you're gonna get feeder from other channels, okay? Let's say you are aiming to get half local, half international students. So if, if, you, if, if your data tells you that you have to do that, okay, then that data will determine how you should deliver your program. Should your program be delivered full face-to-face -face, or should your program be delivered like half face-to-face, -face, half online. 
Okay, or should your program be delivered full online? We are talking about ODL here. Okay, should your program be delivered mode of study? Just just based on one data, je. Saya, saya tunjuk contoh ya. Just based on one data, based on demographic data just now, social demographic. Should your program after you review be offered in a to you to I mode, for example? Should it be offered in a dual degree mode? I don't know. So you can see after you have done the step analysis, then only you can make decision on mode of study, on how you're going to deliver your program, on who's going to be your feeder, on whether or not it's going to sustain, whether or not you should continue uh, what you are currently offering, practicing now, or you should, you should totally revamp or change or tweak some of the things. There's something in the chat box. Let me see what is it in the chat box. Thank you so much for participation and feedback. Oh, in that. Okay, never mind. Okay, ada tak soalan so far on this, how do we use deep analysis and make decision on needs and issues? Okay, kalau tak ada, uh, I just like to share with you, there are many approaches to deliver a program. Okay, sekarang program yang kita deliver, kebanyakannya di Universiti Melayu ataupun di Universiti, ialah kita deliver program kita using what we call a, a normal um, MQA call it conventional, conventional, conventional approach. But a program, as I mentioned, can be delivered in a studio-based manner, in a problem-based manner, in an experiential learning manner, in macam-macam approach lah dekat sini. You can see ada yang studio-based, experiential learning, ada yang game-based, ada yang challenge-based and so on and so on. And you can read the, the feature of all this delivery approach. So this delivery approach is not only applicable for you to use for your program, but it can also be used at the subject level. Okay, so boleh guna at two levels here. Okay. Um, so this is just an extra notes for you to, to look at. If you are reviewing your program, because some of you are reviewing programs, okay. Um, after you have done your step analysis, you may need to make a decision whether to jumutkan program itu ataupun bekukan program itu ataupun lupuskan sama sekali program itu ataupun you re-offer the program. So the definition of what jumut beku lupus is, is all there. Okay. Uh, and uh, to help you for those who are reviewing your program, okay, to help you to make a decision eh, after you have done your step analysis. Step analysis is one thing uh, to help you to make a decision whether to lupuskan program, to jumutkan ataupun to bekukan program. These are all the criteria that has been developed by 20 public university, okay, to help uh, uh, each and every one of us to make a decision whether you need to uh, really close down the current program or not, or whether you need to put it on shelf or whether you, you need to re-offer them. And some of the criteria that they use to consider whether a program need to be discarded or discontinued, uh, for example, is uh, unjuran pengambilan pelajar, enrollment, popularity of the program. Uh, UITM, for example, are very concerned about gaji permulaan, for example. They, dis they decided uh, programs that... Uh, that uh, at the end of the day, will give low uh, starting salary for their graduates. That is the main candidate for the program to be closed. Um, so you can see these are some of the criteria that you can use, uh, a combination of uh, three or maybe five criteria that you would like to use it together and you come up with an index before you can make a decision whether the program needs to be closed or not. So these are just... Uh, additional notes for you to look at. So if you look at the planning stage, uh, needs and issues, you can use team analysis as a tool. Um, and after you have uh, you you have clearly identified that the program is actually needed, you can move on and develop the program. Okay. So these are basically some of the questions uh, you need to ask. Uh, you need to ask yourself, and you need to be able to answer. 
during the planning stage um, in order for you to fill up the uh, proposal form to submit to JPT. Okay, so I have shown you um, some of the things uh, that you can do and by now you should be able to fill up like half of the uh, proposal that you need to uh, fill up from this particular book before you can submit and get approval for the new program or review program to, to JPT. Okay, ada soalan ke? Tak ada. Tak ada soalan dalam chat. Or do you like to unmute? Because we are ready to go for the next stage now. Oh, final hour. Less than an hour, actually. Umur sampai pukul satu ke? Daripada ADEC, can I just call it? Memang sama pukul satu, eh? Ya, betul. <laughs> Alright, okay, thank you. So, let's let's go through this, okay. Um, now, after you have clearly eh, nampak that memang ada keperluan untuk you offer program baru ni ataupun ada keperluan untuk you offer program yang you dah you nak review okay so you are ready now to develop so you don't develop eh, selagi you you do not go and develop a program until you know that it is needed that is why saringan awal tu sebenarnya sangat penting ministry will saring eh, to find out whether the program is needed or not for you okay um if the program is needed, then at the development stage, what we need to do is we need to articulate program philosophy. We need to. This is something that you are very familiar with, and eh? you are supposed to state program goals, sequence your subject, develop courses, and then you have to identify the physical resources and all that, and then you have to uh, plan your teaching and learning activities. Okay, let's have a look at something that you are not familiar with, which is the program philosophy, okay? So again, these are the references that you use and these are the book. Again, this is the big picture in case we have forgotten, okay? The design, this is when you really need to adhere to the design, uh, um, basically procedures. Uh, it is top down, so we have to start from here. Are you familiar with, pro with program educational objective? Are you familiar with that? Yes? PEO? Yes, eh? ini, pen, ini perlu dekat because, thank you Hong. Um, because uh, in COPA, you need to write your PEO. Okay? PLO, familiar? Program Learning Outcome, I'm sure you are very familiar with it. Eh? In UN, you use PEO. Oops. PEO, PLO, CLO. Betul? Kalau you buat micro credential, then you will have your MLO. You can also have your session learning outcome, SLO. Pure, plo, 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 slow. Lepas slow, saya pun tak tahu apa dia lagi. Okay. Just now, we have said in curriculum design, at the development stage, we need to articulate program philosophy. Dalam masa yang sama, we also need to state our program goal. Okay, let's go back to that. Jadi, where is program philosophy and program goal? Where do you think they are? And what are they? Any offers? Let me check. In the chat. Chin said that program goal is it above PEO? Seven. Is it above? Yes. So program goal is above. Hence, program philosophy is above program goals. Betul ke? So, program goals is here. Program philosophy is here. Okay, it is good to see that in UM document nowadays, okay, you have to state program goal. Dulu tak ada. 
Dan in fact, kita tengok dalam COPA pun tak ada tempat untuk kita nyatakan program goals lah. Okay. Okay, tapi dalam dokumen uh, JPT, I think you need to state the program goals. In one of the document, you need to state your program goals. Okay, so let's look at what program philosophy and program goals is all about. Do you know what is your program goal? Anybody? Okay, if you if you are not aware of your program goals, sebab tu lah uh, talent corp, okay, tegur eh, hari tu masih dia bagi taklimat kita university, when they design and when they develop their program, they, they don't see the person that they are going to produce or they are producing, they don't know the name of the post. Lepas tu, <laughs> okay. So program goal, saya nak tanya. Main bola, satu group ada berapa goal? Satu team. Satu. Satu, thank you. <laughs> nah, satu yang ni, buat lawak dia kata ada dua. Memang ada dua, satu kiri, satu kanan sebab dua team dia berlawan. Okay, let's look at this again eh. Okay, saya nak tanya you all soalan. PEO normally ada berapa statement? Actually, semua nak cerita kena tahu ni lah. PEO ada berapa ayat? How many statements are there in PEO? Three. Three to four. Three to four broad statement. Okay. So, thank you so much, Lee, Lee Yong. Um, therefore, program goal ada berapa statement? Satu lah. PLO ada berapa? You all akan tengok nampak pattern ya. Sini ada 3 to 4 statement. Sini ada 10 sebab sekarang ni MQF clusters ada 9 kan. Kalau engineering contohnya dia ada 10, ada 16 macam tu lah. 10 ke 16 lah let's see. CLO lagi lah. Setiap subjek ni ada 3. So, kalau ada contohnya 20 subjek, so we have more than 20 times 3, maybe 60. Lebih banyaklah besar dia kan. So, let's say I will put around 60. So, if you look at program goals kat sini, of course the statement dia ada satu. Okay, we have a lot more. Uh, CLO 4 to 5, PLO 8 to 10, correct, Tiru. Um, and Lee Yong said that Yang lapan tu I guess must be the PLO. Um, Set pen pun kata uh, lapan is actually the PLO. Okay, so thank you so much for your response. So correct. So you can see the trend kan? Nombor dia makin besar, makin besar, makin besar. Okay. Program goal ni apa? So kalau let's say you are offering um, civil engineering program. Jadi goal you ialah siapa yang you nak produce? What do you think? What's the goal? Civil engineering program will produce civil engineer, right? Civil engineer, correct. So that is the goal. The person Okay, competent civil engineer. Thank you so much, Thiru. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so, so program goal is a very broad statement that talks about the profession or the person that's going to be uh, uh, in, in that particular discipline. So this is an example of how we write program aims. Some people call it program aims, some people call it program goal. So you can see here, this is actually from um, a, a, a medical faculty. Uh, this is actually, you can see this, this is daripada program ni lah. Program yang, uh, yang buat digital imaging. Okay, so the aim of that program is actually to produce a medical imaging practitioner. So itulah goal dia sebenarnya. Tapi im medical imaging practitioner yang macam mana? Yang uh, macam as what it described lah dalam bunga-bunga dalam the write-up. Eh? But the goal is one. 
like that. Okay, so let's check what, what is there in the chat. Nanti building room tu tak competent. <laughs> All right. All right, okay. So that is the, the goal. We have not actually done the philosophy. Kita kata goal ni tadi ialah satu statement. Orang yang kita produce daripada kita punya program. Jadi philosophy ni apa pula? What do you think the philosophy? Or what is philosophy in general? Good. Philosophy is about belief and value system. Are you aware that okay, every university okay, is founded with a certain value and philosophy, value and uh, belief. Setiap universiti ada dia punya niche area, ada dia punya fungsi tertentu. UPM, okay, and UM is they both founded for different purposes. Do you agree with me? For your information, okay. Setiap public university in Malaysia dan setiap university high learning institution in Malaysia when they been founded either by the government or by the founder, okay, there, there is a specific intention for why that particular institution been founded. Bagi universiti awam, okay, filosofi universiti itu ditubuhkan ada di dalam apa kita namakan dia sebagai perintah pemerbadanan yang disimpan oleh PUU universiti, okay, perundangan universiti lah. Maybe you have not seen this before, but for your information, every university has its own purpose for why the university has been uh, uh, developed uh, in the first place. So, University Melayu ada fungsi dia, ada niche dia yang University Melayu kena buat. So, to be honest, each and every one of us in uh, as a lecturer need to know why is it that University Melayu exists? Where is the hala tuju of University Melayu? Apa fungsi University Melayu kepada country? You cannot duplicate your function with UKM, with UPM because they have different function and purposes. They have different intention for their development. Okay. So, how does program philosophy, okay, actually impacted on curriculum design and delivery? What do you think? Saya nak tanya. Untuk civil engineering lah, I'm quite biased to my or, or medical or, or architecture. Architecture, for example, we have a person from architecture here or medicine or nursing here um, or medical. Doctors ataupun architect ataupun civil engineer produced by UM, in what way they are different from those being produced by UKM, UPM and other universities, USM? You think ada beza tak? What do you think? Ada beza tak graduate kita? Cik, kita. <laughs> Sometimes I've forgotten I've changed my institution. You rasa ada beza tak graduate UM dengan graduate orang lain? Ada. So apa yang membezakan graduate kita dengan graduate orang lain sebenarnya? Uh, this is going back to uh, Aslida punya soalan tadi. In what way we're going to be different? It's, it is your philosophy that makes you different. As I mentioned, because University of Malaya is a comprehensive university, it's a research university. So basically, if you embrace the philosophy of University of Malaya, meaning that when you design your curriculum, it's highly inquiry-based, it's research-based kind of curriculum. Okay, for example, like, um, we all in UMP because the, the, the reason why our university being developed, being the technological university for Malaysia, we have to embrace uh, when we design our curriculum, we have to embrace that the fact that the university is for technical. So our curriculum, the way we teach, the way we offer the program, the name of the program must reflect the niche area, must reflect the reason why the university is founded. That is why when you submit your proposal to the ministry, 
the first thing that you need to declare, and in fact, you need to declare in your uh, your UM document, also in, in the document given in this book, you have to put there your university niche area. Okay, so that will give an indication that you know the philosophy of your university. If you do not know your university niche area and if the program that you are trying to apply does not support the niche area of your university, you need to have a really, really sound justification as to why you would like to offer that program because it is not your university niche. It's not the function of your university. Bagi, bagi example, eh, macam university sebenarnya tak susah sangat sebab you comprehensive university. Kalau macam kami di UMP, kalau kita, katalah kita nak offer program related to keagamaan. Okay, we all UMP ni university technology. So in what way kita nak justify yang kita nak offer, kekuatan kita adalah keagamaan or language or general science. Okay, so these are why you need to uh, articulate your program philosophy so that, so that you are aware that the program that you're going to develop and also you're going to offer is actually in line with your university niche area, in line with the philosophy of your university. Okay, so that's that. So let's now look at the PEO. PEO tadi, a lot of you are very well aware, three to four um, basically <coughs> uh, statement. Statement three to, three to four statement ni, where does it come from? Where do you think? Where does it come from? Anybody? Remember your step analysis? You have done step analysis and the end of your step analysis, okay, you have identified the kind of person or the kind of the skills and competency that is uh, needed by uh, this person that you're going to craft so that he can lift uh, 2032 onwards, right? So basically, your PEO, okay, must by right, okay, cover or describe your PEO and also PLO must cover and describe the competency and skills, okay, that is needed for 2032. Okay, this, this is not just a simple three to four statements that you put uh, any, anywhere else. So apart from step analysis, this is where I would like you to enhance in crafting your PEO through what we call an industry landscape. Okay, so this is industry landscape. You can see here. Okay, so what are the components of industry landscape? Let's have a look. Okay, so in the industrial landscape, what you have to do is that you, again, using the data that you have seen before, uh, you, have, you have used uh, during the Steve analysis, you fill in all these uh, uh, areas, okay, or aspect, I would call it. The way to go about industrial landscape is that you need to ask yourself, okay, the 2033% okay, will work where? Where are they going to work? Identify industries, companies, where he will work. Okay. After you have, have identified the companies, okay, go to the next one. What will the technology that they will use in those companies in 2032 and beyond. List down, okay? And you must also list down the name of the post or the role that they will um, resume in 2032 onwards. Okay, so normally, if you look at trends and if you look at one of the uh, PowerPoint that I've given you from the Google Drive, the one that you scanned just now, PowerPoint from the uh, World Bank, you will be able to see that there is a PowerPoint uh, suggesting the, 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 the future trend of uh, role that our graduate will resume. 
And if you look at examples of the name of jobs that they will, or the name of posts that they will hold uh, in future, you will be able to notice that in future, you will not be holding a post with a single discipline. For example, a civil engineer. For example, uh, um, a chemist. In future, there might be bio civil engineer or uh, um, civil, um, I don't know, civil. If civil engineering plus entrepreneur, then you will see that the, the future post will be a combination of two discipline, two or more discipline in a post. So if that is the kind of uh, role or position that they will take up um, in future in 2032 and beyond, okay, that shows that perhaps you may need to design your program or your curriculum such that it has both elements. So you might want to go for major, minor. You might want to go for dual degree. You, you may want to go for joint degree with two disciplines maybe. So you will not perhaps making a decision of uh, having to design after you review your program or new program that you would like to offer, having a single discipline anymore because after you do this force, I think you, you see that in future that uh, even the trend nowadays that um, your graduate is now holding a position where they, they need both disciplines. Okay, so that's, that's how you fill in the industry landscape. You must also show the career progression. Is there any progression in the career? Uh, when the students uh, um, have completed your program. So only after you have uh, filled in um, aspect number one, aspect number two, three, and four, then only you will be able to get a much better insight on the skills uh, and also the graduate attributes that you would like them to have uh, in order for them to function. Okay, then only you are ready to write your three or four statement of PEO. So PEO is basically a description of this person. Okay, 2032 punya person eh? in three to four sentences. So what does this three to four sentences consist of? Kalau saya tanya lah kan? Um, senang nak describe PO ni if I ask for example uh, my daughter lah orang macam mana yang you nak kahwin for example who is going to be can you describe me who what type of person would you like to marry okay um, my daughter might came up with a description that oh I would like a person with this 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 disability I would like this person to be behaving like this like this like this and I like that person to be having this kind of intelligence do you notice that in our description we always talk about the three domain um, the one that you very familiar with is the, the cognitive, affective and psychomotor domain that is why PEO is always written uh, in a three to four uh, statement, and that statement normally describes uh, the 2032 person's ability in relation to the to the professional or cognitive domain, to their affective domain, to their psychomotor domain. Right? Is, is it okay? Is it clear to you now what is PEO? Okay, so there are many ways how you can formulate PEO, but today we are looking at how we formulate PEO make by, by using what we call uh, industry landscape. Okay, there are other ways on how you can do this as well. Okay, you can actually do, do it through survey. So you can, after you have done your industry landscape, okay, this is just one representative of um, of the exercise that we have done in Singapore for one of the program in University of Malaya. And after you have done this, you can create a poster, you can put up the poster around your faculty, 
so that your your current student will be able to see oh this is how I'm gonna be uh, and what I will be uh, this is the kind of salary that I'm aiming for and this is the be and this is this is me in in four years time or this is me in in two years time so so this is what we call informal curriculum that help your student to shape him or herself to be that person uh, ready for that profession in 2032. Okay, so this is very, very important indeed. And in Singapore, this is what they do. They put it on the wall so that every student, when they walk along the wall, they will be able to see how they, uh, what are the things that they have to prepare themselves before they can be any one of uh, these profes- professionals. Uh, and they will be able to see uh, what will be my career pathway that I uh, would like to aim for? They will be able to see what are the skills that I need to to develop while I'm at the university, while I'm still at the program, so that I can be uh, that profession, that professional when when I work. Let me see. There's something in the chat. Okay. Okay. It's just your attendance. Okay. So so after. We have done the um, at the development stage. After you have done uh, that industry landscape, and also after you have done your um, so-called uh, steep analysis, you then need to actually by right do the what we call the gap analysis. The gap analysis is where you have already know what is the future competency and skills needed in twenty thirty two. And what is the current competency and skills that you are actually developing in the current curriculum? Okay. If you put them side by side, you should be able to identify this is the gap. Therefore, we need to address it. Okay. Let's say in 2032, you know that your uh, um, your your the talents that you're going to produce will have to work with uh, virtual reality in in your in your workplace, right? Therefore, whether you like it or not, you have to find a way to embed uh, how they can learn how to use that virtual reality so that they are ready for them to work in the industry. So that is the kind of gap analysis that you need to do before you can fill in. All other forms as uh, what um, QMAC and also ESPC asked you to fill in. Okay, so at the end of the day, you can write your PEO. You can see that the first PEO is related to cognitive domain. The second PEO is actually related to the uh, affective domain and, and so on and so on. Okay, so the only thing that you need to be aware of, once you've written your PEO, you need, while you are not once, while you are writing your PEO, you need to have in mind that you need to measure them. Therefore, you need to know if I come up with this PEO, what can I measure and how can I measure? Okay, so if you cannot identify how can I measure my PEO or what what are the things that I can observe so that I can find out whether the PEO is achieved or not, forget about that particular uh, statement of, of the PEO. Right, so we've done on the program goal, we've done on the PEO. Uh, as far as the PLO, uh, it's not very difficult because I think we all know PLO is a one to one thing to uh, the MQF uh, learning outcome. So nowadays they call it uh, MQF cluster. So you have five clusters, but eight so-called outcome altogether, eight or nine outcome altogether. So all I'm saying is that you have to find a mapping between the PEO and also the PLO. I think this is something that you are very familiar with. And you can see if I can show you the link. And I do hope that the hyperlink is working. Takes a bit of time. The hyperlink is not working. I think I will just um, I will just proceed. Cuba nak bagi tahu. Once you have done your uh, PLO, then 
what you need to do is you have to address the requirement of this box. You cannot straight away after you have actually formulated your PLO, you jump to formulation of CLO. Okay, you cannot do that. Okay, may I find out how familiar are you with this? Is this box outcome indicators and performance targets? Are you familiar with that? Anybody? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. What that outcome indicators and performance target box is all about is this particular form. You can see this is actually BR002, UM punya. Okay. But this is the old one. So, what do you nampak lain sikit eh? Um, this is where the forms where we have to sequence our subject. We have to choose which subject belongs to which PLO. Saya tak suka guna perkataan belong lah. What that outcome indicator is all about is that we need to first of all we need to identify what are the subjects supposed to be supposed to be composed uh, in that uh, uh, program okay i will talk about that in a bit second after we have finalized the list of subjects after we have roughly put them uh, on sequence which one is first year which one is second year which one is third year then we need to choose which subject in the program is responsible to develop which program outcome. So that is what uh, uh, that um, box is all about. Okay, outcome indicators and performance targets. Let's first look at how do you choose a subject? How do you choose subjects to be uh, in the program? And uh, how do you sequence them before I address how do we assign which subject for each PLO? Okay, so for your information, again, depending on your step analysis, you must have from the step analysis decided on whether the program is a single discipline, whether it, it has uh, what we call specialization, whether it has um, two disciplines, major, minor, whether it is double major or double degree. So all these have um, implication to how or what are the subjects uh, in, in this particular column over here, all right? So you may need to read what a major uh, program is all about, what major, major with specialization, major mining is all about. But there is a specification on the percentage of core subject discipline depending on uh, the, the type of program that you you will want to you you would like to offer okay is as I mentioned these are all driven by the steep analysis data that you get from the steep analysis what what did your data tells you okay so if your data tells you that you should offer or you should review your current program into major with specialization, you need to know that there must be uh, um, bidang pengkhususan, okay, uh, of certain uh, percentage in the program, okay. And in every programs, academic programs in Malaysia, for your information, there must be what we call liberal education component or MPUs, okay. So, the MPUs, the, the MPU subjects are like uh, used to be Tita Subunga Ethnic, English, uh, uh, Entrepreneurship, okay, Communication Skill and Critical Thinking. Those subjects must make up 10 to 20% of the uh, of the program curriculum. Okay, so basically your core should make up 50 to 65 and elective 25 to 30. Right, and you must also embed things like Sulam, this and that, and these are the MPUs that you need to embed in your program. So all program must have the MPU subject. 
the reason why I highlighted the MPU over here is because MPU has a different audit by itself. The fact that all programs in Malaysia must have the MPU component, if you fail the MPU audit, meaning that the whole program will fail. However, I think University Malaya will not have to worry about this because we have Chitra and I think they are very aware of what MPU and they have taken care of the MPU quite well. Okay, so going back to that, uh, again, uh, based on your steep analysis, uh, you will also be able to identify whether to offer your program using the course work mode or the to you to i mode. Okay, so the coursework mode is something that we are many of us are actually offering where we actually put students to go through many, many, many courses from year one to year uh, four at university. Or you can actually uh, develop a program, a curriculum where you put students through uh, several courses at university, then put them at the industry for one semester and then call them back uh, uh, at the university for another semester so you can do that so you can do do it through in what we call the industry mode or the to you to i okay so basically this is uh, roughly about to you to i just now this morning Reduka mentioned about bringing in the industry so this is how you can uh, place rather than you bring the industry into the university, you can send your student to the industry during the program period. Okay, so there are many combinations on how you can place your student at the industry. Okay, this is, this is perhaps the choice that you have to make because maybe you do not have the facilities or the technologies or the latest uh, equipment uh, at the premise of the university. Okay, or you do not have kepakaran di situ lah. Okay, so you may like to consider uh, um, basically to you to I curriculum. And this is how you can do the, the structure of to you to I curriculum uh, look like. And these are the syarat lah for to you to I uh, curriculum. Okay, for your information. Okay, so these are about subjects. Okay, once you have identify all the subjects you have put the MPUs inside here you have put uh, the core subjects inside here you have put the electives inside here so now let's discuss on how do you decide on the tick on each PLO okay um, which is addressing this box for your information okay each PLO need to be developed progressively. Okay, so when we talk about progressively, it need to be developed from year one up to year two, year three, year four. Okay, do you notice that in this example, there are several PLOs that has not been well developed? But that, which PLO do you think is not well developed? you noticed if you cannot see in mine you can actually open up your um, powerpoint do you see plo9 i i have an answer here plo8 PLO, yeah plo8 plo8 and several other plo right especially the skills the professionalism the ethics they are less addressed okay so if you only develop that PLO, in this case, twice, during the four years, and you expect student to be able to show the outcome uh, uh, achievement in year four, do you think that you will get what you expected? That is something. Another question that I would like to ask you, is it fair? Is it fair to your students? Is it fair if stakeholders said that you are not, we are not developing holistic graduates? We are not actually produced graduates who have, you know, 
for example, like um, great communicator, not great communicator, adequate uh, communication skill and all that. Okay, so you can see that uh, sometimes the problem lies where we do not actually develop some of the PLO gradually and we do not develop the PLO with enough uh, um, subjects in the program for that PLO to be developed nicely, right? So um, in order for us to do, to do this, by right, what happened is that we need to identify for each PLO in year one at least three subjects uh, for each PLO. For example, at PLO 8, we need to find out which three subjects in year one, be it semester one or semester two, that PLO 8 can be introduced. And then we need to for example, we choose this, we choose this, and this. Tiga. Okay. Then what happens is that <clears throat> we need to choose another, for example, three subjects in year two for that PLO to be enforced. Another three subjects in year three for that graduate attribute need to be reinforced. And then finally in year four, hopefully we can find one subject or two subjects where we evaluate the PLO. So by that, that is how we should design our curriculum at the program level. It should be progressive in nature. And at every year, uh -huh. We need to state the performance target. Now, mobile performance target can. For example, let's say PLO8 is, let's say, communication. Okay. What is our target for our student to be able to show or to be able to perform at the end of year one? What is the target in relation to communication skill after year two, after year three, and after year four? After year four is obviously as what is being what has been described in the PLO, right? So this is something that we need to actually do when we develop the program. We need to clearly identify performance target at the program level, performance target being the subject and what we call the outcome indicator. So you can see that the outcome indicator may not necessarily be subjects only. It can also be um, some of the students work like the portfolio, like the exit interview, because in order for us to, to, to say, to, to, to judge whether the outcome has been achieved or not at the end of year one, year two, year three, and also finally PLO at year four, we need to make use of data from at least several sources. Uh, this is a process of what we call triangulation. So subject is only one indicator that tells you that students are actually uh, achieving the program learning outcome. Other than subjects, you can also use interviews, observation from uh, data from observation, you can use portfolios, you can use uh, student, uh, some of the student excerpts of work and, and all that. Okay, so that is what outcome indicator is all about. Performance target. So this is how we set performance target. We can say that, for example, the average score of so-and-so of the program graduates on uh, these are all outcome indicators just now, must be at least uh, one. So these need to be uh, ditentukan lah oleh program owner ataupun oleh faculty. So this is basically the basis behind how do we develop the program learning outcome progressively. And for your information nowadays, there is a trend for uh, people to check on how do you develop PLO progressively uh, rather than uh, believing on your data saying that PLO is achieved. 
So normally they will ask you, okay, um, how do you develop your brain, or which subject are used to be, which subjects are you used to 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 develop brain? Okay, now I see the assessment that you use to develop that brain. Okay, so basically these are some of the examples on how PLO supposed to be developed. You can see for lab work, this is how we can develop students progressively. We can put them on the exercise mode in the year one. We can put them in the structured inquiry mode in year two. And finally, when they go into their final year, we give them project or final year project uh, in, in their final year. So that is how we develop that particular skill progressively. Right, and the, these are the descriptions of uh, how do we develop uh, in the in the lab book, and this is an example for communication skills. So once you have done that, ni saja lah evidence nak tunjuk kalau kita tak develop properly memang akan ada lompang lompang lah dekat sini. Okay, uh, once we have developed that, uh, then only you are ready to fill in this particular form. And University Malaya form for that one is actually BR003. So this is the course level that I'm talking about now. Okay. So I think majority of you would like to listen to this. So this is this is the BR003 from University of Malaya. So you can see here, uh, this is when we really need to apply uh, what we call the outcome-based um, constructive alignment requirement. In outcome ways, there are three components. One is outcome, one is assessment, and another one is actually instruction. And all these three need to be aligned. So what do we mean by alignment? So let's have a look. And let's see how that three OBE component being put in one page. Um, so you can see this is the outcome, this is the assessment, this is the instruction in one page. So what we need to do here is we have to make sure that if our outcome is cognitive in nature, therefore the types of assessment that we use must also be able to measure that cognitive domain. Not only that, it should be able to measure the level of that cognitive domain. Okay. For example, in, 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 this, in, in this document that you see currently, if you look here, outcome number one, that has been leveled at, labeled as C2, cognitive level two. Therefore, using exam to measure cognitive level two is considered valid, is considered aligned because exam has the, has the ability to measure cognitive domain level two. However, if this outcome is cognitive level six, for example, using examination is a little bit unjustifiable and maybe can be considered as not aligned or not appropriate because examination may not necessarily able to measure cognitive domain number six. Another thing is, for example, if you have a, a learning outcome that belongs to psychomotor domain or affective domain, and if you are using examination, you know examination has very little ability to measure affective and also psychomotor domain, that is also considered not aligned or not valid. Okay, so that is one thing. Another thing is if you notice for each learning outcome, I actually use two uh, assessment methods. And the reason why we use two assessment methods is because we need to make sure that the data that we collect in relation to outcome achievement is reliable, meaning that, uh, and, and also we, 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 we do that because we want to triangulate our data. We want to make sure that if student able to show that they have achieved that particular outcome using this assessment method, if student really get that learning outcome, they should be able to perform um, uh, well as well using another assessment method. Okay, we have a question, is it? How do we decide on the percentage of assessment with each? That's great. Okay, how do we decide on this? There are two ways on how do we decide it. One is, one is depending on whether that outcome coverage, okay? Sebab tu saya rasa macam masa memang sangat lah tak cukup untuk ni. Saya just nak cerita dekat sini. Kalau you nampak, 
outcome coverage eh. Contohnya outcome nombor satu saya Okay, cover daripada sini sampai sini Okay, untuk topik satu, dua, tiga, empat So empat topik Dan empat minggu dalam masa uh, uh, dalam 14 minggu. So to answer your question, the weightage is related to the SLT. Okay, so kalau misalnya you spend less time okay, on that particular topic and uh, uh, therefore the assessment weightage should also be less. Okay, so am I answer the question? Boleh? Ada lagi tak soalan? Next. Thank you for the question. Okay. So, macam dekat satu lagi sebenarnya dekat learning outcome ni kalau kita tengok dekat sini dekat learning outcome ni do you notice that I write my learning outcome such that I attach the topic to my learning outcome straight away. For example, this, this first learning outcome this is the topic. The second learning outcome, this is the topics. So you can see because second learning outcome has more topics, you can see the total weightage of my assessment is much higher, 45%. Because it covers more topic and it, 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 it also uh, uh, match with uh, um, my um, SLT. So 45%, okay, so we are talking about 0.45 and because this subject is 3 credit hours multiplied by 120 is so about 1 credit hours is 40 national hours therefore the SLT uh, for that particular uh, learning outcome is, is actually that so that is roughly how we quantify the weightage is it, is it okay with, with all of you? So kita tak boleh contohnya kita ada topik yang uh, satu lagi waktu kita nak design kita punya subject eh. So this is about subject design eh. When we design our subject, let's say we have uh, 10 topics all together. Topic 1 until topic 10. Um, in preparation for micro credential in mind eh. In mind, kalau boleh what you need to do is you break up that 10 topics into 3 block. Okay to three blocks ataupun three clusters, okay? So, when you break up your topics into three blocks or three clusters, you ask yourself, what can student do, okay, after they completed the first block? What can student do after they completed the second block? So, that should constitute your learning outcome. So, that is how I did mine uh, in here. You can see that I have actually... Uh, a, rearrange my topic such that it falls into three blocks so that it, it will be easier for me to develop my credential in future. So for each block, you can see for the red block, I came up with one learning outcome, okay, which I delivered that over uh, week one until week four. And for the second group of my topics, I came up with second learning outcome. For third topic, third learning outcome. So when I when I formulate those learning outcome, okay, I use the steep analysis again uh, and industry landscape. I ask myself, after they have completed the first block, what can they do out there? What can they perform? Which company needed that particular knowledge and skills and competency? So you can see even at the subject level, I have steep and also industry landscape in my mind. So that is how I came up with my learning outcome and how I modularize my, my course and my learning outcome so that my subject can easily be, be, be turned into three micro-credential and they can eventually be stackable uh, for for, for future use lah, okay, for future use, okay. So that that is that is roughly how I design my subject and how the learning outcome has been polished and shaped up uh, in preparation to uh, micro credential. 
I do hope that I, I help and address this uh, interest of some people uh, thoughts about how do we design uh, a macro credential. It's already one o'clock, so I think uh, perhaps we can stop here. I don't mind spending a little bit more time if people like to, to ask any question. And actually, there are some a little bit more that I would like to cover. Um, how, do we, how do we go from here? Um, perhaps we can um, close the session first. Uh, uh, maybe we can uh, have participants to on their video as we we like to capture everyone in. All right. All right. Is that okay? Um, participants, uh, appreciate untuk, if you can turn on your video. Saya rasa untuk design subjek ni kena buat separately. <laughs> <laughs> Sebab nak design subjek yang biasa, nak design subjek yang modular dan micro-credential. Saya rasa yang tu kami kena buat asing lah. Sebab dia ada progression dia. Um, Jenny, are you ready? Yeah, I will stop sharing first. Okay. Okay. How to have a wrap up pitch. Can I do everyone? Um, everyone just uh, keep smiling because we have two pages <laughs> here. Uh, then you will try to capture it as soon as possible. Okay, ready? Smile. One, two, three. Next page. I'm oh, sorry, again. Smile. One, two, three. Next page. Keep smiling. One, two, three. Next page. Okay, last page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, for staying put. And being patient with me, I will I will stay on, uh, and I I I don't mind taking questions or if you would like me to 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 continue and go further, I can I can do so, no problem at all. Um, okay, uh, for those who feel like staying and ask question, please do so. Uh, but please remember to fill up the attendance form and feedback form as we will provide the certificate for those participants who already fill up the feedback form later. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Aisha, can I ask you a yeah, question? Sure. Yeah, sure. this is about the gap analysis you mentioned uh -huh. a while ago, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we basically do that, uh, the gap analysis? Sorry? What was the it? The gap analysis, how do we do that? Yeah. How do we do that? Okay. Yeah. So you had two components, right? One is, uh, is it prior, uh, before, is it pre-enrollment, uh, or was that pre, when they enter and post, uh, and the second one is when they finish their degree, is it? No. Now, how no. does that work, the, the, the gap analysis? Yeah. Okay, let me find the slide for the gap analysis. Perfect.